Can you hear us now? I know, like, <laughs> everybody's trying to figure out why nothing's working. This is why we have the, the pre-show banter, right? What are you talking about? Twitter stream? We're not on Twitter. Uh, loopback is, uh, go ahead, Mark. Well, I, I don't get this. Well, hang on a second. What, what is happening here? I don't, I don't understand. Uh, like, so only like, okay, I'm going to do the show solo because nobody, nobody can hear anybody except me. Peace. <laughs> Right. Okay, that's that's a new one. No, I don't. I don't understand. Okay, this is. Uh, I did upgrade Loopback today, which uh, I hope didn't screw everything up. Yeah, that's dumb, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and furthermore, etc., etc. Is it? How, so you guys, I can see my voice on here. Something got screwed up. Right? No. No, I, it, <laughs> I don't know why that is for you, Mark. I can't, because Brian's not complaining. That's weird. I didn't change anything on that. I didn't change anything. Why would that be a problem? I, I, it's very strange. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at it. Let's take a look. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, get your questions ready because we're going to have George Gomez on soon. It's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, for some reason, Loopback's only doing my audio, which is not how it's supposed to work. I just enabled all your audio on my arcade radio. So they, they can hear you a little bit. Yeah, they can. They can. Like, I, I can see they can, they can hear you now. Yeah. Right. There's a delay. I don't have a laptop, dude. <laughs> well, that's screwed up. <laughs> It's it, yeah, it's very interesting. So, uh, you guys should be, uh, what? You can't hear them at all? That's totally effed up. <laughs> I can't wait to hear this replay. Yeah, me neither. I'm just like, I'm going to play games. Oh, I heard myself. You did? Yes. Uh-oh. No, we're back. We're back. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> yeah. We're back. 
Okay, now I'm going to mute the other audio because it's going to drive me crazy if I do that. Because you're back from out of space. Should we test uh, <laughs> sound effects or something? Or We should. Let's see. Hey, guys, can you hear this? Live from KOYR Studios. We're here. Oh. Oh, yeah. Did you hear the... Yes, the... that sounded working. perfect. Right. sounded so good. Dave is saying he tripped over the power cord. <laughs> By the way, you guys, I want to say, uh, you know, I want to give a little shout out to Voices. He's having some trouble. Voices, FYC, 2021. Uh, <clears throat> brothers in Arcade, we, we, we stick together. So whether you're having a shitty day or not, I just want to say, uh, we're 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 there for you. So, Arcadia forever. Blech! Wait. <laughs> how, how do you make an R with your? I don't. I don't, I don't think you can do it. It's a R, <laughs> this is the double R. No, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's uh, talk about the Google Doodle since yeah. we didn't. Yeah. Let's because hey, we, did you guys we started see that Google Doodle. Yeah. As I, I was saying, I tried playing it and then I kept getting called away from work and I'm really mad that I didn't get to see the uh the the five different variations, is that it? Yeah, there's a bunch. You can there's a bunch of cartridges you can click on, you can play different games. It's pretty cool. So Jerry nice. Lawson, obviously the creator of the cartridge video game, uh was honored on Google Doodle today. Pretty cool. Wow. Super cool. It you was like really it. so you could play a game, then make a game. There's a whole bunch it was so if you haven't checked it out, definitely go check it out tonight. The other thing that was interesting in, uh, you know, pre-show banter, you know, is, uh, what is it, Kylie Jenner? Yes. Let's talk about Kylie Jenner for the first time ever on Arcade yeah, Radio. it's terrible uh, because Pac-Man, right? Baby Pac-Man pinball. Mm -hmm. and, and like the Sun in London wrote an article about how she has like such an expensive thirty-five million dollar house, and then they show you with this shitty little <laughs> baby Pac-Man pinball machine that is not restored, is original, and they're like, these usually cost two to fifteen thousand, and one almost sold for a billion recently, and I'm like, who is writing this? <laughs> <laughs> a billion? What game sold for a billion? I would love that. Yeah. My Billy like, Mitchell Pac-Man did not sell for a billion. No. Well, you made more than, what, 300 then, I hope. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. But yeah, well, you I put, mean. You put your hard the, work into it. The scale of what those, like, people at that star status deal with is just so detached from reality. You know right. I mean? It's just like a completely, like, I mean, if you told them this baby pack was like, <clears throat> you know, two thousand dollars or this baby pack was two hundred thousand they're like okay right that's nice right <laughs> i guess i'll bump the insurance up no they don't care they don't even worry about that <laughs> wow but yeah the whole article made uh kind of a, a big deal that you know her daughter is getting to kick it old school with vintage arcades and retro technology which i thought was pretty nice although the kid is like not playing the game, I think. It, well, I know they showed her playing it one time, I think. With like uh, one baby yeah. Pac-Man machine. Yeah, and what's funny is that the description of how the game works, it's like you can switch from playing pinball to playing Pac-Man, like as if that was, I don't know. They simplified the, the the summary, but it, it it's hilarious. <laughs> Jabaruga, you would think with all that money, Kelly would be able to afford a less shit pinball. I, I actually own one. I have not tried to troubleshoot it to see if it works, but it's in nice shape. It's in storage. Does anybody here have a baby pack? We have one up mm. at Starcade. That's mine. Mm. Nice. Oh. That was one of those. That was like Tempests for me now. I had like four of them at one point. They just kind of kept finding me. But you got they're, a, not, gr they're you, not much you, fun. No. Do you have a Granny in the Gators? I don't. I was actually, there was one for sale. I, I half considered going after it and then i remembered how crappy baby pack is and uh, <laughs> yeah all right we got some What's new people point? in the chat i want to welcome them uh billy seven oh he's not new okay calico oh. 1981 that's pretty cool uh <laughs> demerge 28 drape that 
I fucking he hate did, the name. He just bought one a baby pack for a billion. Joe Drosen, Mike Page, welcome to the show. Mr. Peabody, welcome back. Metropolis and Voices. FYC. And and more. Oh, this is good. Uh you guys, uh, we should start the show. Wait a minute. Did we talk about what we, oh yeah, we need to start the show. We did. We need to start it, but I do want to say I do like reading the chat just in the order. Stern's next theme will be the Kardashians. Oh. Voices FYC. I've repaired them ages ago. <laughs> uh-huh. No. They're still broken. Get Maybe. back out there. No, this is not nef- nefarious is what that is. Nefarious. Oh. Let's get well, this show. On the show? Road. Yeah. Shows where we're where going. We're going. We don't need shows. <laughs> but but we need an intro, so. Live from KOYR Studios. This is Todd Rogers, the king of video games, and you're listening to Arcade Radio. What's new? What's new? What's new? Did you know that Chuck E. Cheese was born inside the jar? Five, four, three, two, one. No matter what I say, it draws controversy. Video Mania has ripped the universe. So what's the score? Oh. Cut that Eugene Jarvis guy off. Is anybody actually going to watch this? Does anyone actually listen to the show? Anybody? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Hey, oh, thanks for listening in for the Arcadosphere. This is season seven, episode two of the Arcade Radio Podcast. Today is Thursday, December 2nd. First. Well, I don't know why it says uh, second. Damn but it. I, why'd I do that? I'm reading it in it this way anyway. It's <laughs> December 1st, 2022. And the time is approximately, I don't know, 7 30 p.m. Central. Uh, thanks for listening in. Uh, I'm your host, Adam Majors. I'm joined by my co-host, Mark Timerner Shields. And last and least, Park Avenue Hooker and Ladies what? Woman. <laughs> what the hell? <clears throat> oh, sorry. There's different text here. Oh, Par- yeah. The Par- other Paradise Arcade Shop proprietor and part-time snowblower. You got to be careful when you say that one. <laughs> Part time snowblower salesman. It's Brian Thurston Howell, Ermitage the Third. Adam didn't. Adam forgot this was the <laughs> podcast. Not the and only joining us recording. tonight. <laughs> as I talk over Brian, our returning guest and host is an inventor. He's an industrial designer. He's the creator of both pinball and video arcade games. He's still the real deal, folks. A quadruple threat and more. Ladies and gentlemen, we present to you Mr. George Gomez, later in the A golf clap. He'll be on uh, top of the hour. So we got some stuff to get through here, right? How about some gadgets? Yeah. Should we do some gadgets? Or, or do you guys want we to jump? Do, Wait. When do, what we've been working on? Okay, let's, let's just do that quickly. Okay. Mark, quickly. what have you been working on? I uh, I went to Minnesota. I came back. I got sick. Uh, I stopped at Paradise Arcade Shop. It was awesome. I loved it. Got a bunch of cool mold mold rama stuff. Uh, I'm still working on my computer space, learning things about the S3 chassis, which General Electric sold and changed the name of the chassis, even though they never changed the actual chassis. It's identical chassis over like maybe over ten years. Um, I think that's it. What about ah. what about you? Well, I've been I sold an Aztec pinball machine, and I. Uh, on Monday, went out and bought a System 1 Gottlieb Buck Rogers, and that needs lots of work. So huh. uh, I ordered, uh, first of all, the on the way home, the back glass flaked off enough that it was time to order oh a new gosh. back glass. Oh, no. So I got a mirrored back glass from Holland coming to the tune of $500. So Sweet. Uh, a yes. lot of money, but you know what? Worth it. Uh, also, System 1's apparently a pile of crap made by Rockwell, a uh, defense contractor in the 80s that has never made a pinball machine but Gottlieb had nobody in R&D that could actually make 
uh, solid state at the time. So they contracted Rockwell <laughs> and they like, okay, you guys haven't made pinball? Great. You guys should make us a pinball. So they made a bunch of pinball <laughs> machines and they fucking suck. So um, we, I'm replacing can... every goddamn board in that motherfucker. <laughs> so wow. it works. Uh, and that's what I'm working on right now. Brian. You know, that really makes you feel safe about, like, tanks and stuff. Like, ah, we, 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 we can't handle a, a pinball machine, but don't worry about the tanks. They'll be fine. <laughs> oh, sorry about uh, the fucking language, Brian. Sorry about so that. So, let's see. I've been, um, I fixed a Solar Quest, fixed a Star Castle. Okay. I uh, got those up to Starcade. We actually ripped the bar out of the second room at Starcade. So, we were two uh, restaurants next to each other. One was an old Pop Belly, one was a Green Mill. We ripped the um, uh, bar out of the uh, pop belly side, and now we've expanded another 20, 25 games up there, which is awesome. And then the um, – That means there's the – other... it's like 260, 275? Well, no. We're like 180 now, 180 games okay, or so okay. up there. It's it's getting pretty presentable. It's glorious. It, it's so oh, – we the, the my favorite part of it so far, and I've got to do a show up there, is that we – I built tiers up one side so when you walk in there's 36 games tiered up so you the bottom row is namco then it's nintendo and then it's williams so all you see are 36 well 12 williams marquees 12 nintendo marquees and 12 namco marquees all in a row Very cool. like going up like a stadium seating so it's it's kind of cool um but we continue hmm. um we continue kind of building up there which is a lot of fun got a lot of games on for up there and then the other uh pickup latest pickup is boxing bugs so side art's gone uh and the um the main power supply in the bottom that runs the 6100 is not the original uh cinematronics one it is an atari one that's modified but everything else in the cabinet is original boxing bugs hardware and this is actually a boxing bugs cabinet with serial number and tags on it so i'm really excited about this not a conversion very cool Mm. Mm. So, uh, you know, since Brian's jibber jabbering away, let's play some. Let's let's have a little fun and, you know, limp along to the. I don't know. What the do you guys Gadgets. Think? Gadgets. Yes. I always felt that the true stars at Atari was engineering. Oh, you're an inventor. Yes, I am. What have you invented? A lot of things. Like? Like a lot of things. Like things that you've heard of. Like? Well, things that you will have heard of, okay? Patents are patents. <laughs> Welcome to the gadget segment. I've got two quick things. Well, three Why things I got right behind me. And we moved right on. Um, <laughs> so three things to talk about today. I'll make it relatively quick. The first is uh, very exciting. We got the official okay from Atari. We are moving forward on the circuit board. So Lunar Lander, Black Widow Gravatar and Major Havoc and Warlords will likely be released in um, December. One of the really, really cool things about these new boards is they're not just going to be a... They, there are reproductions of the old boards, but the traces are included on them. And one of the things we've gotten permission from Atari to do is to actually rev up all the boards. So if the Major Havoc was a Rev C, um, the new board will be a Rev D. They have official logoed hologram stickers on them that we're having the Atari... Uh, kind of swoosh made into hologram and put into the stickers. We really are trying to put a lot of effort into these to make them really a special piece. And there will be an option to print the history of the game on the board or get it just plain. Super excited about that. Working with a couple of great guys from KLOV on that and the Atari folks, and um, it's all coming together. We should see those in December and then hopefully following up about one to two boards a month thereafter. Um, so we're really looking to, to build up the library on that. Um, Lunar Lander's there. The other product that everybody's been asking about is, you can see, we've got working ice cold beers running behind me. So um, they're going, uh, we, I actually have my final meeting with the production team on Tuesday to go over a few last things. Then we're going to run the production line one more time for two trial cabinets. Make sure those are how we want them, and then they should be running down the line. One of these is slated to go to Uptown this week. The other one just went to uh, Starcade tonight. So I'm um, starting to move along. Uh, where, uh, Jeff the Guru asks, where can you order these boards? They will be available at uh, Paradise. A lot of the stuff that we're doing, if I talk about anything Atari, and I'll bring it up again, 
Um, Atari's asked to have uh, asked Retro Arcade to have a single vendor. Um, and Retro Arcade is not doing retail, so Paradise will be the vendor of all the Retro Arcade Atari licensed products. Wow. Wow. Um, Holy there, qu- Wow. We will be selling, um, actually, we talked to Marco. Marco's going to be carrying some ice cold beer parts and some of the other stuff for repair parts. <clears throat> um, but for the Atari stuff, that will be us. The final thing I wanted to bring up uh, so we met with the Tato executives down at uh, IAPA. And this has been out for a few years. I think we talked about this a year or two ago, but I got to play one. I haven't seen this before. And so they brought these mini candy cabs, which are kind of fun. Um, the, so nice. you know, the Egret 2 was actually one of the... I don't have an Egret 2. I really would love an Egret 2. Um, but the Egret 2 is known to be one of the better... The whole Egret series is actually one of the better candy cab series available. <laughs> but... Is that Adam telling me? So anyways, selection of games on here. One of the fun things about this cabinet is you can actually rotate the monitor and play horizontal or vertical games. You have just like the uh, the small arcades that are available from other vendors, HDMI out and USB in to play it with uh, remote sticks so you can play all their games. Runs on USB-C, but a lot of fun. So that's it. Any questions? Yeah, that that monitor, it, that's a flat screen right on that little guy, but it looks beveled or something. Like it, it, it's curved. So the so the old um so the be- the the bezels on the candy cabinets all had a little bit of a curve and what they hmm. did, which is really nice, is they put this plastic kind of lens almost like the Aztrac had that bubble. And so it's a bubble of plastic over a flat screen. And so it does kind of have a really neat effect to it. Neat. Looks like a CRT. So. They did a nice job with it. I mean, it's yeah. it's a neat it's a neat game. Um, it's the controls. I, so the controls are a little goofy because they don't tell you like they say hit button D E and F and like there's zero labels of which button is which, right? Oops. So <laughs> that's a little a little goofy. But um, you can see there's a large collection of games. There's even a slot here to expand the games. So there's an SD card slot. But so you can load any game on there. I don't know. So you can't load any game, but you can expand the games that are on there. Hmm. So. Speaking of that, Nintendo if it, uh, Switch, if you have sports, uh, they just released Golf for free. It, it, wasn't, nice. it wasn't originally included, and now they include Golf, so you can download it for free. Nice. I'm down. That's kind of cool. Now I just need to buy a Switch. Woo-hoo. So we... We're going to have a special segment. Ah, special. Are you, you know, are you guys ready, I'm ready. for a special I got, segment? I'm, I'm prepared. All right. Uh, we're not doing the news today, uh, but uh, every once in a while, I think we're going to do this this season, uh, and we're going to call it uh, What's in the Box. What's in the Box? What's in the Box? What's in the Box? <laughs> Segue to the only fans. expecting like chris farley and patrick swayze to walk out or something at one point all right so here we have it yes i'm gonna unbox this lovely uh new wave toys uh thing here it's a a replicate missile command arrived yesterday uh i decided to save it for the show i thought it'd be a little bit more fun uh so first of all, I'm using the right tool. I've got a, a screw here <laughs> to okay. open, open the package, you know, because you've got to have a screw for your package, right? So, right. 
Yeah, we use one. a flu- we use a fluorescent green uh, box box cutter so that you know we use it for opening boxes and also going up to the third floor of Mall of America. <laughs> now the fun thing about uh, Replicate is they do these cool things where it looks like the crate the the arcade game came in. Amazing. So it's got the Atari logo. It's got all the the warnings on it, right? So we're gonna go ahead and take this out of here. Should make a little head- tiny pallet to put it on. That'd be fun. That's right. I'm, that'd be kind of fun. I'm going to take my headphones off. Okay. So I'm going to be talking, and you're just going to be like, okay. Well, we could be sa- we could talk shit about him while All he's right. over so there. So we got to get this <laughs> thing out of here. Want. Damn. Here you go. Step one, get a box. This is the, the Step box. Two. This is fragile. This side up. Oop. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Got a right. hole in the box. And uh, let's see here. Uh, we're gonna... <laughs> put, your stu- put your junk in the box. <laughs> okay, just a second. Uh, I gotta find a hole. I didn't cut a hole. Uh, in the box. Uh, oh, Step see? one is you gotta cut a hole in the box. Uh, so He's, he catches so his here on. we go. Um, there's a little. Oh, hole. look! He's looking this down there. Than the other ones. They had a little glue oh. here. Are we gonna get booted there's off the Twitch? A little bit of glue. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, and here we go. Oh, Uh-oh. oh, look at oh. that! Another look box. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and here we go. Scared the cat, so uh, this is the the box inside the box because now we've had it's triple boxed. It's yes, pretty, pretty well contained there. That, that's very safe. I'm gonna get my trusty screw out again. Um, Back to the screw. You, you can't open a box without using a screw. Okay, here we go. I, Stay hydrated. Got it going here. It's much safer Maybe when by, you know originally they were just replicate, and then I think they decided they were gonna do. Boom boxes, and by the way, during the um, during the Black Friday sale, they had their little micro boom boxes on sale for thirty six bucks. Amazing! So They're really great. I actually, sounding. I actually got my boom box, uh, my yeah, wife's boom I box the big one, from her the childhood uh, when we were in Minnesota. 90. Nice. All right, yeah. Look at all I, that noise, right? This is the first time we've ever really unboxed something on the show. So this is I true. Mean, we showed the Cubert before, but uh, that was sort of already open. Okay, so now uh, it doesn't look like there's any more tape, so let's see if we can... Oh, these boxes are really nice. You don't want to wreck them. you got to be careful. Yeah, Whoa! Cool. And then right off the bat, the manual. It's uh, This is Lin a little manual. book that you can read about the missile command. Uh-huh, uh, the history. Uh, you've got your USB charging cable. Probably a micro again. I wish they'd switch that to a, a USB-C. It is micro. That would and be then good. Um, a little piece of card or a foam here. We'll put this right here. Let's see. Oh, here we go. It's a nice. <laughs> it's coming out. He got it. Is it? Oh, yeah. All the way. All the way. Oh, okay, here we go. And oh, my gosh. All, there's some tape. Oh, pull it. We should always have a Coleco one go. on, uh, you know, because these are so much bigger than the Coleco. Okay, is it... and we have a little bit of plastic on the monitor. We got to take care of that. Uh, oh God. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, and so here we go. This is the the replicate. Look at that. Look at the That's detail. That's so nice. I mean, we're talking, you know. The stickers on the back are accurate. It's crazy. Yeah, it's very cool. Should we turn this thing on and see what happens? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I bet you it where's turns the on. switch? Oh, here we go. I'm top. just thinking. Maybe. Right. We'll see. There we go. It probably plays Spy Hunter. Mm. This is a George Gomez. Yeah. think it's charged up. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I see the oh, lights. The, the little lights came on. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I do like how, I do like how they do things like have the CRT have the um, fluorescent flicker when it turns on. Yep. Yeah. Like there's a lot of subtle details they pay attention to. It's kind of fun. Nice. All right. Here we go. Oh, there it goes. Missile command, da, 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 Look da. At just that. like in war games. Oh my god! <laughs> now, oh my gosh, uh, it looks just like the missile command I have, but miniature. Yes. I'm gonna hit the player one button. Oh, that's we're annoying. Gonna, I gotta turn that. We're gonna play wanna, chicken. Uh oh. <laughs> You'll I'm have no idea. Player one. Oh, wait, now you have a, a <laughs> He hasn't noticed here. yet that what you're doing. <laughs> so, screen brightness. Oh, I hit something. Uh-oh. Go ahead. 
pull the trigger. Reset high scores. <laughs> Seg- the segment. <laughs> See? I'm in the I'm in the menu. <clears throat> How do you get past that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't do that. I power it off, that's how. Adam. What's in the juke? That trackball is pretty good. <laughs> that's a little trackball. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Wait, what song is this? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> what, are you making fun of me? No. Sounds like not at all. We would never do that. That was awesome. Yeah. That, was that was very amazing. fulfilling. Was that as good for you as it was for us? <laughs> it was better. <laughs> it's always better for me. <laughs> I don't know. Like, of course, it's kept unwrapping. I was getting worried. I say done. Safe. Now we have to put it. Now you have to put it next to your other ones. Right. Nice. I, I think uh, that was a pretty. Yeah, we did it. Fun, successful. Uh, now now I, I need to practice before if I have to open something. I feel like you've set the standard, and I've got to like raise the bar. So. That's right. Better lighting, better dialogue. <laughs> I don't know. I think okay. I'm going to use the box cutter. Though. <laughs> you know what that sound means? That's right. What does it mean? We're going back to the cave. Oh, good. Back in 82, I used to be able to throw a pigskin a quarter mile. Back, back to the to cave, the cave. With, with Time Runner. Hey, so heavy in that future. Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? Hello, and welcome back to the cave, where we give you a quick slip of Back to the Future news. From Walt Disney World News, Christopher Lloyd will reprise his iconic role of Doc Brown for the new Back to the Future Out of Time Escape Room experience at Universal's great movie Escape. What? The experience is described as, great Scott, Biff's at it again. Uh, He's stolen Doc Brown's newest time travel device, whatever that is, to sabotage the timeline for his gain, as usual. (laughs) Follow Doc's clues to find the prototype, track down Biff, and save the day before you are out of time. They are totally pushing that out-of-time thing. Lloyd will likely be seen in video clips, though. Universal boasts, this is not an ordinary escape room experience. Most escape rooms have video intros and outros, and some have video clues as well, so... This thing opens up December 9th in a mere eight days. In addition to Back to the Future, guests can also select the Jurassic World Escape es- experience. Fun. Where the hell is this? This sounds this sounds wonderful. Okay. That's <laughs> now I ask you what's what wait, what's wait in, a minute. You wait, can't what's do that. <laughs> That's so quick. Do you want to talk about uh are, do you do, have you ever been in an escape room? Either of you. I have actually been in one, yes. And I have in, never done it. I did it in Tennessee. Okay. Tennessee. Yeah, it was... Uh, I don't hear Brian. Brian, are you muted? He is muted. muted. It was a lot of fun. Yes. Uh, enjoyed it quite a bit. You know. I, so, I have not done one. Oh, you have I not. Thought... <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. You're like, I haven't a, either, but... you're like, screw that. I don't want to do any of those. I do. want goats. Yeah. I want to do it with my Back to the Future nerd friends, though. So, Brian Jones would like to know if there were goats in the escape room. Why would there be goats in the? I don't know. I, it's it's very that's an odd question. I mean, maybe there's a Thor escape room somewhere, and there's some know. screaming goats, or maybe we should go to the next question. So what's in... what's in the juke? Cheers, everybody. Welcome to the Season 7 premiere of What's in the Juke? It's the game within a game within a podcast. Today, we feature super short, isolated audio tracks from a retro technology we used to call television. Brian Thurston, Howell Armitage will be your scorekeeper if you can guess the title of the I theme song. I learned it by song. watching you. Shut up, kid. If you can guess the title of the theme song, you will get... Half point. That's right. If you can guess the name of the network that featured this show, you will also get... Half point. If you can guess both... Full point. That's right. If you don't know either, please fight it out amongst yourselves. Now that the fighting is over, let's... Get down. 
<laughs> All right, here comes your first track. Some believe that there may oh. yet be brothers of man <laughs> who even now fight to survive That's a, somewhere have... beyond the heavens. Is that actually even isolating the track at that point? It is. There was sounds and shit. Some believe Ryan that there it. may yet be brothers of man. Who... I think this Nobody is the, the greatest sci-fi intro of all time. I want it somebody. Somebody. Mr. Peabody gets the network. Nice. That is Battlestar Galactica and ABC. Nice. nice. Good work. Good work. Okay. Uh, here comes a uh, half point. Half for point. Both of you. Okay, here comes the next track. These other ladies know us as Buffy and Hildegard. But they also know us as Kip and Henry, Buffy and Hildy's brothers. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a good one. Yes. All right. I noticed a pattern on this network. A lot of intros, a lot of talking. Like <laughs> Buffy Slayer. Hazo Bosom Buddies. Bosom Buddies there you go. is correct. Half point. Half point. And Jabaruga gets another half point for ABC. Half point. Full point. All right. Here comes your next track. Once upon a time, there were three little girls who went to the police academy. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Three little Once girls. upon a time, there were... there were three little girls who went to the police academy. <laughs> Joe Drosen gets ABC. Half Brian point. gets Charlie's Angels. Nice. Half point. And it's a Step rare up, condition this day and age. Oh, let me play that again. It's a rare condition this day and age. Oh, my goodness. That might be a deeper cut. I'm not sure. Yeah. People are knowing that, getting the pattern, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rare condition uh, this day and age. <laughs> they're, they're consistently wrong. <laughs> so, well, I, and it's hard. So I got to call. I'm not sure which one to call ABC because people just keep saying ABC from the last one. Right. So sure. I think I'm going to go Mr. Peabody on that one. Sure. Yeah, just give give it to whoever. Oh, Mike Page got Mike it. Mike Page gets nice. Family Matters. Half so point. <laughs> we should just give a full point away to the people that actually get the show. Yeah, at this point, I think we'll just do one point to the, uh, if you guess the title. Okay, the one point, the title Don't only. Everybody right. figured out that it's ABC. All these are from ABC. So all ABC. That's what I do. Yeah. Like last week was all NBC, right? Right. Yep. Right. All right, here we go. Here, here's your next track. Believe it or not. <laughs> Boy, that's going to be close. I'm not playing that again because we're going to get flagged. <laughs> I think that's the third time he says it. So. <laughs> oh, third time. Uh, all right. Proc just got another point. So, uh, Full Mike point. Page, Mr. Peabody, let's step this up here. You cannot let Proc win. <laughs> I'm going to start. Check your check Facebook. I'm going to start sending you the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Next up. All right, here comes, your, here comes your next track. The second can hold me when I hold you. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. <laughs> that was tough isolating. They were pretty munged in the background. Half point. Brian can you got run it him? again. Full point because we're giving full point for show. Okay. Full point. Nice. We do have... George joining us slightly soon. Well, not slightly, soon. So let's soon. go. All right. Uh, next track. This is my boss. A self-made millionaire. Quite a guy. Wow. <laughs> wow. It's so ma it's amazing. All these shows have these intros. <laughs> and it, it's mostly this network. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah, so some charged. executive decided, this is how we're doing all these shows. Right. Mike Page with Heart to Heart. Nice. Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah. All right, oh, Mike. We, coming we up in another, second place. Another track we got to play? Sure. Okay. Uh, full point. Full point. And the next track is. Uh, We're going to make our dreams come true. Do it our way. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> and yep. cut. And. <laughs> well, Begin. Good. Good. We're not getting flagged for that. No, not for <laughs> that. Brian with Laverne and Shirley. 
Full point. Oh, no, I learned it by I watching you. I got a Chabaruga. I apologize. Oh. I, I learned it by watching you. Took it away from Brian. Thank you Full very much point. for stepping up there. Oh, you messed up. <laughs> Next up. Okay. Uh, geez, we're we're almost done here. Okay. Here comes. Oh, this, this is a callback to a previous one. Right. All right. This one, uh, if you get the network, you get half point. Believe it or not, George isn't at home. Please leave a message at the beep. I must be out or I pick up the phone. Where could I be? Believe it or not, I'm not home. <laughs> I'm going to put that on my freaking voice. I am. I had to. I married. Point for Seinfeld. I had to marry two half of point. the times it's played in the show to make it perfect. So. Again. That's awesome. Good times. Believe it or not, George is at the home. Leave a message hey, at the beep. Maybe George could use I this. I must be out, or I pick up the phone. Where could I be? Believe it or not, I'm not home. Half point. No, nobody's guessing the network. NBC. Okay, your NBC, next track. NBC. Moving on. Is you'll see that life is a ball again. Laughter is coming for you. Wow, you can really hear the harmonizing. It's amazing. Let's hear that again. You'll see that life is a ball again. Laughter is coming for you. Oh, he left us so early. Mm, yes. Mike Page with threes come half point. Full, Full point. point. All right. <laughs> Okay, Brian, where are we at? We got one one of these left. Wait, did George? We, just last join us? one is worth three points, so anybody can beat Brian. Okay. Brian is in Proc is in first place with four points. Mike Page in second place with two point five points. Chabaruga in third place with one point five. Mr. Peabody and Joe Dorsen taking up the fourth place and fifth place spots. Okay, here comes your last track. There is more to life than what your lip. So take a chance and face the wind. Wow, that's a terrible song. It is, yes. It cut out the background singers. Yep. There is more to life than Joe Drosen, who's the boss Take for a four points, face the wind. takes the lead by a half point. Full point. Joe Drosen. Oh, very good. Here we go. That's nice. Nice. That's... So the final final uh, outcome was four point. Uh, Joe Drosen in first place, first place with four point five. He who shall not be named in second place with four, and Mike Page in third place with two point five. And everybody else. Oh. Thanks for playing. And we'll see you next week on the Price <laughs> Is Wrong, Biatch. Okay. <laughs> hey, do we have a voicemail? Oh, we do. Let's oh. check it out. Sure. All right. Okay. A voicemail. All right, here we go. Thank you for calling 612-548-GAME. This is Arcade Radio. Please leave your message after the tone. Hey, everybody. It's your buddy, Bob's Arzadek, control panel expert and technician. Hey, I just want to let you know that I took care of that super Bob's Arzadek. Remember last voicemail where I cloned my brain and created an AI? Yeah, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> but but you know what I am doing? I'm designing my own video game. Yeah, I, I haven't decided if I if you want to have you fix control panels for points or go to people's houses and fix their broken control panels. I'm not sure, you know, but uh, hey, have, have I ever mentioned that I drive a 1973 Reliant Robin? It's only got three wheels and I save so much money on <laughs> wheel alignments and new tires. It's awesome. Anyway, so maybe I'll make you drive my Reliant Robin in the game. And if you hit the wrong button, you know, smoke will blow on your face or the, the door will open, the car will try to throw you out and kill you. I think this is great. This is a great idea. I need to get on this. I wish I had trusted that Super Bob AI. Well, let me, hold on. Hey. What do you want, master? Hey, are you, you any good at video games? Of course. I have bad skills at them. They are my bad. Ah, oh, sweet, sweet, sweet. So can you, can you make a new game? Of course. How many levels do you want? Oh, hey guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go while I work on this. 
you have a great show, Mr. George Gomez. I love that guy. Hey, ask him if he drives a Reliant Robin. I bet he does. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm out of here. Do you want to wear underwear or a bathing suit in the game? Hey, I'm. Hold on, you're getting ahead of me here, Super Bob. <laughs> oh, sorry, my bad. Okay, Zard the deck out. <laughs> what was that? I'm not really sure. Want, He's. Do you want to wear underwear or a bathing suit in the game? Okay. <laughs> Clearly, clearly not even a, a, a question. You, you, when would you wear underwear? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, which sequence is... <laughs> anyway. Wow. Oh, well, it's 8 o'clock. It's 8.03. Uh, I may have to make a pit stop. I'm taking my drug. Oh, wait. Hey, boys. Hello. Hello. I was just about hey, to call doing? guy. Yes, doing great, sir. How's it going? I like your... Uh, Wow, I like the shop that you're in. Yeah, it's my. You're looking at my office. Oh, interesting. Studio. That's Stern Pinball. Yeah, that's nice. pretty cool. So, what's uh, going on? Well, you know, we have this guest. Uh, <laughs> that's joy. Oh, wait, that's you. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we're uh, we have been looking forward to having you on the show for a while now. Um, yeah, so- we've been we've been. Um, We've been struggling to line up a time, so I'm glad we could do it. You know, yeah. I'll, I w- I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you guys, the next time you want to do this, if you want to do this again, you just got to give me lots of, um, you know, just, just you, you can't call me up a week before and say let's do this. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's kind of how we are. Well um, uh, as much as I'd love to, my life is just freaking complicated. <laughs> I, know. That's it, awesome. oh, I love it. I love it. So uh, we just finished all of the warm up ses- you know, section of the show, and, and and we have a little bumper we're gonna play, and we're gonna get right into the interview because uh, we have lots of questions. So I just want to say thanks for joining us, and uh, let's get this thing on the road. Uh, you know. All right. All right. Here we go. All right. <laughs> This is welcome George Gomez to the show Stern Pinball. Uh, George, how did, wait, how'd you pick that and not uh, Peter Gunn? <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, I got Wendy Carlos. I didn't get Peter Gunn. <laughs> well, so Wendy Carlos sounded a little more fanfare. I oh, know. Peter Gunn got is it. my ringtone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, all, all you youngsters always tell me, man, dude, that's the Spy Hunter music. I was like, <laughs> Well, don't tell Henry Mancini, okay? Right. Right. <laughs> oh my God! You know Henry Mancini would have made a good uh, Bond uh, composer, probably. You know, right? Blake Edwards yeah. might have made a good uh, Bond movie. I don't know. He technically <laughs> did, didn't he? <laughs> I, 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 uh... Yeah. But uh, yeah, so welcome back to the show. We are thrilled to have you here with us, uh, Brian. Why don't you kick us off? Uh, with a question for our guest. I, you know, I, I was going through a lot of kind of uh, interviews and things you've talked about, and, and I just had this question for you. Was, was Gerald Ford a nice guy? <laughs> <laughs> wow. you like, where'd you find that? <laughs> I, I deep dove some interviews. I was having some fun. I kind of like Googled and then flipped a few pages down to find the stuff that no one else was looking at. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So I'll give you some background. Uh, when Mr. Ford was president of the United States, I must have been, I don't know what, um, 18 or something. And, uh, and I'm an Eagle Scout. Uh, Mr. Ford was an Eagle Scout. And he was coming to Chicago to, uh, they awarded him the Distinguished Eagle Award, the Boy Scouts of America did. And what that is, is it's an award that's given to people that are successful, that were Eagle Scouts, uh, and and they b- became successful in whatever the profession they chose to be, right? And and it's, it's a really rare uh, thing. And so um, I, I think that they called, you know, they, they called a whole bunch of uh, kids. They, it, it was very much a photo op. It was at the, um, the Conrad Hilton Hotel in Chicago. And so, you know, Gerald Ford flies in, they land on the helipad, you know, the whole thing, right? And, 
And then you got this audience in like the grand ballroom of the Conrad Hilton in, in Chicago. And um, and I was one of the ki- like a, a small crew of kids, like probably five kids that presented him with the award. So I had to lead all these people in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Scout Oath or something. And and so um, and it was in the, the, the Chicago Area Council, the Boy Scout, you know, the 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 sort of official part of the Boy Scouts in Chicago called me up. I don't know how they, I have no idea how they picked me. <laughs> um, maybe because they, they maybe they wanted a, a cross section of, of ethnicities on the stage. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's how I got picked. But in, so in 1974, I was part of the, the group of small, a very small group of scouts that presented Mr. Ford with the, uh, President Ford with the, um, Distinguished Eagle Award. And I have no idea. I honestly do not know what interview you found that in because I, <laughs> I've not talked about that much. There is a famous Chicago Tribune uh, photograph of me and Mr. Ford on the stage with a giant American flag behind us. And if I had, if I had known you were going to lead with that, I would have had the photos so you could share with your audience. I will send it to you guys, and you can share it afterwards. <laughs> well, I, you know, and one of the things I have to say, you know, I, I, have, I was not a scout, um, but have known a number of Eagle Scouts, and it is impressive. So, I mean, just to do that, uh, you know, as a kid, I mean, hats off to you for pulling that off, because that's not a, that's not something you just fall into. That there's some real dedication to doing that. Yeah, I mean, so. Thank you. I, I think that the, the thing that people don't realize is that when when I was 16 years old, that was the hardest thing in the world. Yeah, right. I bet. So it's kind of like you know, you know, it, it like it takes a long time. You know, you start when you're 11, and you know, some guys drag it out and they they make it. You have to do it by the time you're 18, and some guys get it done just in time. Some guys actually miss it and don't get it because they like whatever couldn't get it together at the end or whatever. Um, I managed to get, I managed to get it by the time I was 16 and, um, and, and, and I reference it all the time in my life because, um, it was the hardest thing I did when I was that age. I've done harder things as life, you know, life presents you with different challenges as you, as you get older. And so, but I, when I say I reference it, I, a lot of times I think to myself, you know, that was a really hard thing to do. And, and I did it, I figured it out. And so it gives me encouragement when I face new hard things that I can, that I can sort of uh, get there. And it, it, it helps me kind of, you know, get my head together about whatever, whatever thing is being put in front of me. So I, I think in, in, um, in my experience, and, you know, scouting is different for everybody, but in my experience, you know, I was, I, um, I'm a Cuban refugee. I was seven years old when I came to this country. I grew up, um, you know, spent two years in Miami when I was nine, my family moved to Chicago. I picked up scouting when I was, I think I was, I was a year late. I was like 12 and, um, and it was impactful to, to me and my career and, and, and just to all just kind of in my life, everybody has a different experience. It was impactful for me. Uh, I think that uh, there, it's interesting. There's a new, I think it's new. There's a Steven Spielberg coming out, movie coming out about that touches on his life. He's an Eagle Scout and it touches on his life. And I think he's like s- devoted a section to, of, to the movie to that that part of his life. And and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it because I, um, like I said, it, you know, it's different for everybody. And um and you know, not to not to spend a lot of time talking about scouting, but um, one of the most amazing things that's happened recently is that within I, I think it's within the last four or five years, uh, women have been in, in, admitted into the Boy Scouts of America, and women have been getting Eagle rank. And um, and 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 I got to tell you that they are making it look easy. They are just <laughs> kicking our asses. <laughs> And down the street, I was like, I think I was like, I, I like every time I'm in, I'm on, you know, I follow all these different sites, and I get every time I get presented with, 
here's another woman Eagle Scout. I was like, going, wow, they are just killing it. And, 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 you know, I think about like, damn, this thing, this thing was like freaking hard when I was 16. <laughs> 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 they're just ripping it up so it's it's great it's it's awesome so my, so anyway one of my one of my <laughs> most uh one of my uh, favorite mentors was an eagle scout and he speaks with a, uh, the same reverence that you do and it just it was a neat it was something i found in in kind of the history and the interviews that was neat i found one other thing i wanted to ask you about yeah because i thought it was funny and it was interesting and i'd never heard the story but i heard that the sales team made you modify the design of the discs of tron cabinet and you yeah. talked about why. And yeah, I thought it's, that was it's hilarious. the thing. And it was like, and you know, I honestly, I'd forgotten all about this. <laughs> I completely forgotten about this. And uh, there's a guy, a, a, a friend of mine, a guy named Duncan Brown, who's a software engineer. And he works at one of our competitors, Jersey Jack Pinball. And Duncan was telling me, I don't know how we got on this subject, but uh, he. Uh, he said to me, man, those cabinets, what the hell were you thinking? So apparently he was working at a, at a operator or distributor or something. And he had a deal with placing disc of Tron cabinets on loca in locations or whatever. And he says to me, he goes like, why is it not two pieces? It was one piece. It's like crazy. And, and I thought, no, no, no it was two pieces. And I'm thinking, I so I certainly designed it as two pieces, and and at the eleventh hour, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, this is how crazy this is. Plywood doesn't come in that size. No. There it is, right there. Yep. So so now I'm gonna find. I have. I told. I promised Duncan I would find my drawings on this. I I may still have them. And what I did is, the front half was essentially an upright, and the back half made it to the made it to the to the uh to the front half there were big mending brackets that you bolted together so that you essentially got two boxes you got the the back half and the front side and the story you're referencing is very true the sales team was afraid now you have to put this in the context of 19 you know whatever that was 1982 or 83 that they felt that there was no way that they could actually uh, consistently and reliably deliver a front and a back to the locations. <laughs> so, they, so they said, honestly, like, so they walked in and they said, no, 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 you're crazy. Some guy's going to get all the backs and some guy's going to get all the fronts. <laughs> <laughs> What are you guys talking about? It was like, this makes no sense. I mean, they don't even make plywood that wide. So they took Lenksmith, the, the Valley Midway Cabinet House, Lenksmith. Um, they had a take. They, they took two plywood panels, mended them together, literally, yep. you know, mended them together, and then routed the opening and created this giant thing. So the only thing, the, the only uh, uh, caveat that we made was, Okay, it's got to be small enough that it, like the width fits through a door and the height fits through a door. And we just have to, you know, the only thing you're going to have to deal with is the length of the thing. But, but honestly, I had completely forgotten about this because <laughs> it was like a billion years ago because I'm 67 years old and I was doing this shit when I was 26. <laughs> and, and, and Duncan Brown said to me, he goes, oh no, those things were one piece. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I, I swear I have my drawing where any designer worth his, you know, yep. worth his stuff would, would say there's no freaking way. First of all, they don't even make plywood that wide. <laughs> so, you, know, they, you know, who would think to? It was like freaking Link Smith mended plywood panels together and then cut the, the center out of them. And that's how they made the cabinet. Wow. It's you know it is it is an uh, ungodly large cabinet and the one of the funny things is over time they're really hard to move so they start to shift. One of our chatters actually helped weld a base for mine. So there's angle iron with these really low profile wheels because I there's no easy way to move it around. Right. Um, there's a it, lot there. There was in in the original. I mean I don't know what shape your cabinets in, but but there was a bunch of structure added. It, uh, it's, to the, yeah, inside of there. 
like there there are it, I think if I remember correctly there are plywood plates uh reinforcing those sides on the inside oh it's 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 built like a you know pardon the expression but a brick shit house I mean it, it's solid but it, this is 40 years of people yeah, pulling it off a truck it putting it on a truck yeah. tipping it on its side getting wet um but you know I mean I I'll, agree one of the I'll guys tell you another that, story I'll tell you oh, another story yeah. about that cabinet there was a sales guy. His name was Dick Canopa at Midway Games at the time. His grandson is one of my production managers here at Stern Pinball, Nick Canopa. It's weird, you know, like uh, coin up, coin up history, uh, coin up. Uh, I don't know what it is. People that come up in the business, whatever their their families are in the business. But Dick Canopa was a sales guy at Midway Games, and he used to tell me that. He used to say, Gomez, if I can't sell these things, I'm turning them into sleeping berths in the Tokyo airport. <laughs> <laughs> you remember you recall, but at the time in the Tokyo airport back in the 80s, they had sleeping berths and you could like, you know, you're like in between planes or you had your plane got delayed or something. You didn't need a hotel room. You could like, you know, you could rent a sleeping berth. And so it was like a really small compartment and with a bed and you could you'd spend the night there. And he was he was saying, he was like, I'm selling these to the Tokyo airport. <laughs> That's, you know, it's, 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 it is it is an impressive cabinet. One of the chats, one of the chatters who also said it takes three gorillas and a donkey to move one. Gorillas and a donkey to move one. Also, said it is the most badass cabinet ever. It really is. <laughs> it, it's It's such a perfect combination of the game with the effects, with the appearance. I mean, it, it really, it pulls everything together um, in a so, way that hasn't been done since then. Well, you know what, you know what I was, I mean, so I was, um, um, you know, at Midway at the time, the guys that I admired, that I actually admired in terms of the, the, the you know, the cabinet designs uh, were the guys at, at Atari. And so I was very, I was always very conscious of what the, the what the guys at Atari were doing. Now, I I worked in an environment that was substantially more restrictive. The Midway Games of that time was uh, I had I had handcuffs. I had a much bigger, stronger handcuffs than the guys at Atari had. And so I I watched, uh, you know, and I and I watched from afar. I would see their stuff, and I would, you know, clearly we we owned Empire Distributor. I was just telling somebody the story that the beauty of Valley Midway owning Empire Distributing was that when Atari had a hit game, they were, you know, Valley Midway was profiting, right? Because we were selling that game, right? So we had we and we were profiting. We were we were getting it on all sides because we owned uh, Aladdin's Castle. So Aladdin's Castle is operating. Uh, whatever the you know missile command and empire distributing selling missile command and so you know um and and of course you know the 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 valley midway products but so what you know you're you're also selling the competition's products so you're 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 getting it on all sides um but um uh, yeah i think that i i admired the atari guys a lot and 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 what they did with they were you know the very sparse really clean lines beautiful cabinets really unbelievable and some and and they 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 um they had more freedom to play with materials than i did so the tron cabinet was a real breakout for midway because yeah. they they um you know the like i i got a lot of stuff uh past the powers that be by saying oh no this is what disney wants and it was bullshit it's what i wanted <laughs> <laughs> Disney, Disney didn't say Disney didn't say boo. You know, it was like it's kind of like I would go to Disney and show them, and they'd go, "Oh, that's beautiful." And then I would go back to Midway, and I'd say, "This is what Disney wants." <laughs> <laughs> that's like playing mom and dad, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. I want. I oh want to go gosh, to the home. Amazing. Mom said I could. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. I worked. I I worked with um, a guy, the the effects director on Tron, a guy named Richard Taylor. And I went to, uh, you know, the company would send me to the West Coast to Disney, Disney Studios and I would see what they were doing and they would invite me to dailies and which was really cool. And, you know, I'm I'm 26 years old. I'm my you know, my eyes are 
as big as saucers. And, <laughs> and, um, and the day that I, I said to Richard Taylor, I said, I said, what do you, you know, I, so I have to do, I'm, you know, I got to do a cabinet for this thing. What do you, you know, what do you, what do you think is a, like, what do you, you know, what do you think? And he says, he says, you know, I don't know, show me some stuff. And so I was like, okay. So it literally takes me down to the animation room at Disney studios. And, and they had back in the day, they, they, you know, this is, uh, you know, 1982 or something or 81 and they don't, they're not working on computers. Like all the computer stuff that's even being done is, is for the Tron project. And it's so primitive, right? Like he says to me, he goes, I can get you, if you want an image of the solar sailor, I can call I triple I, I forget who was rendering that stuff. They had two houses that were doing all the heavy duty rendering magi on the east coast and i, I think i triple i was on the on the east coast on the west coast he says i call i triple i tomorrow and in two weeks you'll have a rendering of the solar sailor my 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 computer desktop will render that same solar sailor image in about 30 seconds today <laughs> right <laughs> that's crazy isn't it I'm not kidding I mean, it's like and so he would say this to me and I, and so so he says so he says, I don't know, show me some stuff. And I was like, well, I don't have anything. He's like, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll get you, I'll set you up. So he, he takes me down to the animation room. And there's animators and, and there are these desks. The best way to describe them is they look like school desks, like when you were a little kid, except that the thing in front of you has, a, 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 has basically a light table a very small light table and the light table rotates and it's got pins so that they would take the animation cell, drop it onto the surface of the light table, register it on those pins. So there were holes in the, in the film that would register and then they would draw and then they would hand off that cell and then it would do another cell. So he sits me down at one of these little desks with like, uh, you know, a bunch of markers and some paper. And I render a bunch of different shapes for the Tron cabinet, different concepts of things that I had in my, the back of my head and, and, uh, things that I, and I went up there and, and him and I sat there on with the stuff on his desk and said, you know, this, this, then this one, that one, that one, what do you think? And, and so the, 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 the two of us said, you know, he, he wanted it very symmetrical. And I said, oh, I can do that. So we, you know, we made the front look like the back. And, and I, had, I had sort of mocked up that whole cockpit thing from Gorf, right? Uh, Dave Nutting did that for Gorf. We happened to have some Gorfs laying around. And so I said, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to rip out the, the Gorf windows and I'm going to put like that image you know, that MCP image uh, 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 behind it. And uh, you, I think you guys have heard the story about how I made the, glip, the grips glow. I, I think I've told that story and I'll tell it again if you want, but I, I think, so yeah. I had that, I sort of had that much. Yeah. And, and so the conversation with Taylor was uh, about what do you think the art on the side should be? And what do you think the, sh the form, the shape of the cabinet should be? So he picked I, one of the shapes I had was the shape that you guys know. And he said, I think I, I like that one. It's symmetrical. And I was like, okay. And then that's went back to Chicago and that was, that became it. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you have made some of the most iconic cabinets and machines in the arcade, in arcade history, but you've also worked with some of the most iconic themes and some of those themes you got in like, Tron was relatively early, and I, this is kind of a funny transition, but you, I mean, you just, the theme you just picked up with Bond is like yeah. this 50-year iconic history with 60. passion. 60. Yeah, I mean, so what's it like? So, I mean, Tron, you're, you're at the front edge of things, right? You're like one of the guys leading that out and carrying that charge. There is no history. You're part of that history, right? You're making it. With yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you that back in those days, um, I mean, I think the, I think the story's been told a lot. But um, look, I was nobody at 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 Midway Games at the time. I was nobody. I was just a guy. Um, and um, 
and we begged myself and and the lead programmer on on Tron, Bill Adams, uh, and a friend of our and another friend of ours from that era, that the guy who designed the the Midway Carb Rack Two, the MCR Two system, hardware system, the electronics hardware system, um, a guy named Atish Ghosh, and the three of us, Bill Adams, Atish Ghosh, and myself. We begged to be included in the the sort of the internal uh, midway uh, competition. You know, it was, and I don't competition is a loose word. I mean, it's like they basically what they did is they said they had uh, midway owned had two captive development groups that were external to the to the internal you know the internal development uh, uh, effort, um, and they were Dave Nutting and Associates. Dave Nutting was a great mentor of mine and, and you know, a, a tremendous, I mean, uh, if you if you don't know who he is, look him up. Um, and then the other guys, Ron Halliburton, Ron, Ron yep. um, did many, many things. And Ron had uh, equal equal influence on me. And, and, and I think that, you know, and Ron was running Arcade Engineering that they had come from Allied Leisure, a company, you know, they had spun off from Allied Leisure, another coin operated game company. And and so these two guys ran these development groups, and I have to tell you that as a 26 year old guy, Dave Nutting would pull up in front of Midway in his Ferrari, um, <laughs> you know, wearing like white Levi's that had like Disney cartoons um, uh, uh, printed on them, and you know, and he would, you know, sometimes he would be wearing a cowboy hat, and I mean, it was like, it, I mean. Th- they were to say that they had a presence and they were, impre- you know, they were impressive was is like, you know, just kind of um, uh, touching it mildly. <laughs> so, you know, I'm 26 years old and we're wearing ties to work. OK, yep. you know, like we're wearing we're wearing ties and, and, and suits to work. And and here comes Dave Nutting's Ferrari. So I was I was super impressed with these guys, I wanted to be them. Um, and the company thought that they were going to, you know, that when the Tron guy named uh, uh, Tom Neiman, who did a lot of the licensing in Midway, was one of the very early uh, guys that did licensing in, in the business. Um, and Tom brought the script back because he had somehow got wind that Disney was doing a movie about video games. He brought it back to Midway and and we heard about it. It was like it was kind of rumor in the hallways. And I think our boss had told us that this was going on and we begged to be involved. And and they, they were they, and no one in a million years, I can tell you that no one in that time imagined that we were going to be the guys um, that ended up with the project <laughs> because because of the presence of Nutting and, and, yeah. and Ron Halliburton and Arcade Engineering. And they, they were they were just. First, I mean, they were cool. They had experience. They knew what they were doing. They had so much, you know, they had so many games under their belt. We were nobody. We were just, you know, yeah, okay, all right, those guys want to, yeah, go ahead, let them show something. But nobody imagined we were going to be the guys. And and I think that, I think that the reality was that that those guys, both Ronnie and Dave, they they sort of took it for granted. They thought they thought the companies, you know, yeah, it's going to land with me or it's going to land with Ronnie. I don't know. And, and I don't think they even, you know, so it's kind of like when we went to talk about, you know, when we went to pitch the game. They really they had nothing but a conversation about what they were going to do. And but but Bill Adams, Atish Ghosh and I, we busted our ass and we had a thing. We had stuff. And, and they. It was that stuff and that enthusiasm, the passion that won the day. That yeah. and the other thing that the other thing that won the day was the fact that Bill swore up and down that we could make this deadline, and 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 we had. I mean, it was a crazy deadline because we had to. The games, Tron games, had to be in arcades so that they could run that competition, and then that competition had to line up with the uh, you know the, the the debut of the movie and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's crazy stuff, but we. You know, we did, and we did it. We did it. So, but um, I, you know, I think that when you say I've been involved in a bunch of stuff, and and you know, I'm 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 very blessed. I'm I'm lucky. Uh, at the time, at at, and I always, I'll tell you that I work as hard on the ones people hate as on the ones people love. I don't know, you know, I don't know how they're going to resonate. Um, Bond is 
Bond was very special to me. Bond, this is my James Bond. I said, you know, I, I'm 67. So when I was 10 years old, I had a very hip aunt, my mom, my mom's older sister. And she said to me, I saw this amazing movie and I have to take you and one of your friends on Saturday to see it. She took me and a friend, dropped us off this big theater in Chicago, big marquee with the lights and the entire theme, you know, theaters themed out and Goldfinger stuff. And we went in there um, and we went in there and, and, and the, the, you know, it was, we were blown away. We'd never seen anything like this. It was a, it was a, a, a cultural phenomenon to, to, to say the least. And uh, in the, in the way that star Wars was a cultural phenomenon in 1977, yep. I have to tell you that. And I know it's hard for people to envision that because you've got 60 years of bond and, you know, some people are Pierce Brosnan bond fans and some people are Daniel Craig and some people are, uh, you know, Timothy Dalton, some people are Roger Moore, but the, the, the Sean Connery films that I chose to represent in the latest, uh, uh, Stern pinball, uh, games are, they define the genre. They define the spy genre in the in the sixties and 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 in the future in terms of entertainment, and they define sixty years of James Bond. So so while all of those talented, incredible, incredibly talented actors have worn the mantle of James Bond, and in, and reinterpreted James Bond, there isn't a one of them that hasn't been influenced by Sean Connery's performance in James as James Bond. Not a one of them. Right. And, and I don't care what they say. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so I so I think, um, uh, you know, I you know what? I, I'm blessed. I've worked on Batman. I've worked on uh, both the Dark Knight and the 66 series from when I was yep. a kid. I've worked on Lord of the Rings. I've worked on Iconics of Deadpool. Just, I mean, really all over the map. And I, my portfolio it has uh, just a... a I mean, I like I said, I've been blessed. That, That's amazing. That, well, I, I, you know, you you got to raise your hand for the stuff you you want, and yep. and and the reality is that design teams. I'm not a one man show. I've had in, I've been surrounded by incredibly talented design teams uh, on every project, and they've all included. Uh, I mean, they've all uh, uh, their contributions, their creative contributions have made a mark. They've elevated my work. So the reality is that everybody likes to focus on the game designer. And that's that's great. I, I you know, uh, the, you, you need somebody to so to sort of say, follow me, boys. But and that's important. And, and laying out a vision is important. And it, it, just like a director in a film is important. But the reality is that there's a bunch of really talented guys executing on that vision and extending that vision and helping me make it real. And so I, I've had I it just just like I've been fortunate with licenses. I've also been fortunate with some of my partners in, 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 in some of these in, in executing on these products. And so um, nobody, ever, you know, I think that I think the best designers are all about getting the best work from all the people that surround them. And if you're getting the best work, your work will be better. And, 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 you know, there isn't any of this me, 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 I, 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 it, the reality is that I wouldn't, you, you wouldn't be interested in talking to me had, had all those people not helped me execute on these games. That's real. That's that's freaking real. And anybody tells you otherwise is full of shit. Really, <laughs> honestly, it's like you know, yeah, no, it's it's, but you know, we're we're in a we're in a we live in a designer centric society. Everybody wants to, you know, they love the notion of this hero and the, the, the sort of the lone wolf, right? That that can execute, and and you know what I. You know, you, you just got to wrap your heads around, you wrap your head around the fact that you got to lead people to get to a place to they to bring you their best stuff, to collaborate, to to extend it, um, to make it amazing. Right. And, yep. and so um, I'm fortunate, really fortunate. Um, 
Uh, Bond Bond has been uh, it's been it's been a crap load of work. It's a difficult license to work with from the standpoint that there are 60 years of content and and those people know what they're doing and making uh, the and I you know, pinball is a very strange medium. It's very complex. Lots of different stuff, lots of moving parts. If, you ever, if you're used to, you know, really? um, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's it's probably the most complex product they've licensed. They don't even know this, but it's probably well, the most complex so product they've licensed. I have a question for you related to that. So you have to deal with all these licensors. Uh, you, you call them up. You say, I'm going to do a James Bond. Pin- I want to do a James Bond pinball. We want to work with you. Uh, there's an anniversary coming up. Coming up, you, you're well aware of it as a Bond fan, and uh, and and who knows what other reasons why you decided to to approach them. But here 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 you are approaching the licensors, and you're like, well, um, I I want to you know we want to do a, a Bond pinball machine. Do the licensors even really know the value of marketing Bond through pinball? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I can. Um, so. Okay, so for your audience, right? We're we're the we're the we're the largest manufacturer of pinball machines in the world. Um, we export a large percentage of our product. We're an American manufacturer. We manufacture the games in the United States, and um, and our current uh, the makeup of our audience currently is that more people uh, put pinball machines in their homes. Uh, uh, so so the the, the 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 consumer market uh, the consumer elements of our market are actually larger than our commercial elements commercial elements meaning a pinball machine that you see in a bowling alley or in an arcade or in the lobby of a movie theater we actually have more people buying them and putting them in their house now than than there are people putting them in commercial locations now commercial locations are pre- pretty healthy we're doing great with with barcades we love barcades we love we love breweries. Breweries are have have really embraced our product. It's a great fit for the sort of recreational environment of a brewery. Um, so I think that that when certain brands like we've become we've the 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 portfolio of brands that Stern Pinball has worked with is the blue chip licensing portfolio, right? It's like yeah. you name it. Um, you know, Led Zeppelin let us do a game, right? Yep. Uh, Marvel routinely, we work with Marvel routinely. We work with Lucasfilm routinely. Um, we've worked with Universal. We've worked with, you know, we just did Godzilla with Toho. I mean, I mean, we have the blue chip portfolio of brands. And so those brands are very aware that the only way you're going to get this amazing, you know, glowing three-dimensional toy that that's enormous and impressive is is really to work with stern pinball um but some brands are less aware and so in the situation with bond i think that um you know they the the every licensing relationship at some point in time not only talks you know not only addresses the issue of is this product consistent with brand image but it also addresses the issue of what are the revenue um you know what what are the what what is the revenue potential of this relationship yep because because it is going to require work on both sides it's going to require that and and the brand could just as easily put those resources on on a on a product that would that would provide greater revenue. So I think I think that's one of the things people miss is they um I, we've done more licensing stuff lately at our end like the ice cold beers and stuff is that people don't realize yeah you've got this great idea but the people you're talking to have tons of opportunities yeah and you have to convince them your opportunity is better it's your opportunity may be a good one but it's got to be better than their other options yeah for sure I I think that um so I think Bond. You know, we were new to them, um, and 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 honestly, unless you unless you follow certain elements of, of of pop culture, you might not be aware that pinball machines are totally happening today. 
Yep. And and we've we've essentially I you know I I I like one of the few things that I you know I mean I I try not to brag but I think we've been instrumental in the renaissance of pinball. And yep. and so sure. we've we've been instrumental because of the quality of the product in in not not not, not and I'm not just talking about the physical quality of it. I'm talking about the the aesthetic and appealing, compelling quality of, hey, this is a really fun. Uh, we I I don't I I say this and I completely believe it, and I know that it's it's what you expect me to say. But we make the best pinball machines in the world, and we make the most fun pinball machines in the world. And I, you know, I mean, I truly believe that. I I want to play. I want to play a stern, a, a modern day stern pinball over some of the iconic classic stuff from the nineties that I made at Williams Valley. And they were at the top of their game when I was an employee, an employee there and I was designing pinball machines for them. And, and honestly, I, I have fond memories of those games. I own them all. I, I love to, to revisit them, but they do not keep my attention like um, my uh, like any of our modern product and if you if you like I have on my staff I have some of the best pinball players in the world walking the halls of our company and I I am uh, I I we've actually had this discussion it was like you know that 90s stuff is interesting it's nice it was good in its time but we're making better stuff and and we're making it um, in in every way it's more compelling and so so I think I don't, you know, we've been, we've been to, to bring the point back to your original question. We've been responsible for the Renaissance and pinball. Some of the brands need to be exposed to that. I don't think 007 was, I don't think, you know, I, I, I don't know that 007 understood the impact of what they were, uh, you know, uh, getting involved with. I think they know now. And I think that, you know, I think they're very happy with what we've done. And I think, I'm very happy with the co collaboration that that you know the things they've exposed us to. It's a brand with a lot of you know a lot of history and yeah. and they are very clear on what they are and what they are not. And and I think that that you know uh I hope that you know well I I know that my product represents that. It it James Bond the the six original Connery films are near and dear to my heart. That was my James Bond. It was the original. As far as the world is concerned, that's the original James Bond. Even though you know I own yep. all the Ian Fleming books, sure. Um, you know I've read my way through probably half of them, and 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 I have huge respect for the notion that he truly invented James Bond. But but the films. Uh, evolved James Bond and created a James Bond for the times. And, and if you look at James Bond over the years, he has always been a man of the times. Yep. So the Daniel Craig, James Bond is, is, is a man that it's more, it, those interpretations are closer to our time. Uh, the Connery ones are closer to the world in 1962. And so I think that, I, you know, but for me to do it justice, I, I had to work in the genre of the bond that I knew. So in, in, with respect to that, I mean, your designs, the toys in the machine, I got to play it at APA. I got to play the pro and the premium at cool. APA cool. and, and I, I loved it. It was a blast. Cool. I'm not one awesome. of the best pinball players, but, um, when you're doing these themes, because it is it is a an amazingly complex theme. Yeah. Is there a battle between staying true to the theme and producing a good pinball machine? Like, do you find that to be a like? Is there that's times a when you're like when you're going yeah, like a, I want to do this toy, but I don't know where to put it into yeah. this theme. Yeah, that's a challenge. Um, that's a challenge for every license, not just James Bond. Uh, because at at the end of the day, um, you know, I one of the one of the big one of the big th uh, issues in in working on Bond is there's so much material even in those just six films. Even if you say I'm going to restrict myself to those six films, and I you know I've said this a lot. I said my my two favorites are Goldfinger and Thunderball. I think those guys were all firing on all eight 
um, you know, I, I was telling somebody the other day, I was saying, like, you know, Sean, not, it, it was it was a combination of things. Right. Sean Connery in those years was, you know, very much in his prime and very much, you know, fit the 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 image. And 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 so you 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 have a whole combination of things. Right. He was, you know, the Ken Adams designing things like the, you know, the gadgets, the DB5, all the, you know, the the John Barry with the music, the you know all of the artists that they were pulling in. There's a great Prime. There's a great series on Amazon Prime right now, or a great uh, show on Amazon Prime right now called The Music of James Bond. If you haven't seen oh, it, you should see it. Awesome. It's, it's incredibly it's really uh, good. insightful into into a lot of that stuff. Were you, um, were you able to were, get we're all about, the James Bond moves, music into the games you wanted to? I didn't get all the stuff I wanted. I really wanted Shirley Bassey's Goldfinger um, uh, tune, and I really wanted Tom Jones' Thunderball. Those are the two that I did not get, uh, and it, and and I didn't get them because not because of Miss Bassey. Uh, I think that the 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 publishing is just really complex and very expensive, and I couldn't afford it. Mm. Uh, I think that uh, I got, you know, because I got Shirley Bassey on 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 uh, one of the other, you know, one of the, on, you know, Diamonds Are Forever. I got or I got Nancy Sinatra and You Only Live Twice. I got, you know, I got and I have a bunch of John Barry that comes out of the John uh, comes out of the James Bond theme and into Goldfinger and back out. And the same thing with Thunderball uh, music. I got the I got the From Russia With Love theme. The problem with those themes is that relative to pinball, those are love songs. So I was telling, I was telling, I said, guess what? We're going to have some amazing credit rolls. <laughs> you do a credit roll, you can actually play those, you know, those theme, you know, those themes, right? Um, yeah. But the big, but, but honestly, I'll tell you, we knew right away, without the James Bond theme, you cannot do a James Bond uh, game. And so we, you know, we, we knew I knew that, and and you guys will appreciate this. The, the the you know life has it. Life is funny. When when after I did Tron, the, the midway as a perk sent me to the JAMA show, the big Japanese game show in, in in Tokyo, and and it just so happened the Sony Walkman had just been introduced, and I came home with the Sony Walkman, and one of the tapes that I bought was James Bond Greatest Hits. <laughs> And I'm, I'm flying back to Chicago from Tokyo um, and I'm listening to James Bond's greatest hits and I'm thinking about what are we going to do with this? And the thing that I, the, th the thought that I had was those scenes in the films when against all odds, James Bond has to overcome, you know, like the, the little Nelly scene and you only live twice and the helicopters come in and then the Bond music comes up. And you know he's he does this thing, and you feel this, the 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 this tension of this epic battle, right? And 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 so I thought, how do I get this in a game? And I came back, and I and I'm talking to Bill, Bill Adams, and and uh, you know we we were coming off of the height, you know the the successes of of the Trons, and the company, you know, gave us some freedom to what do you guys want to do, kind of thing. And we would go out to lunch, the three of us, Satish and Bill and I, and we would talk about things like Blue Thunder. You ever see? Rem oh, remember yeah. that yeah. movie, right? Yeah. Roy Scheider and you know a helicopter with lots of weapons and oh, yeah. and you know for a while there we were thinking you know we're gonna do let, why don't we do and we weren't even thinking about licensing it. We were just saying you know we do a helicopter with a lot of weapons, and <laughs> and 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 I came back with this and I was saying no 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 Bill it's got to be James Bond we're gonna do James Bond. And that same licensing guy that I mentioned, Tom Neiman, that that uh, could you know brought home Tron. He came back to us. We we started. We didn't even have a. a we didn't have a, a, a Spy Hunter wasn't a thing. It wasn't a project. It was um, uh, Tom Leone, who was one of the programmers on Tron. Uh, uh, him and I are both Cuban, and we used to go. We used to drive home together stop at his mother's house she would make cuban food and and we talk about what we we're working on and and i i kept talking to tom about you know i want to do this game which is this james bond game and of course he knew james bond he wanted to do james bond 
and we're both sort of children of the Cold War, if you will. And and we started this project. It wasn't even a sanctioned project. It was just like a thing we were doing. This kind of road, and I drew this road, and these things happen, and you got these enemies. And, and for a long time, we worked on this sort of like it was very much not our thing that we had to work on every day. And And during that time, one of the things we did is we took that, we digitized that James Bond tune from the cassette and we would play the game with the cassette. And, and so when it, you know, went and saw Tom Neiman and said, Tom, can you get us a James Bond license? And I'll look, came back and he goes, I can't get you a James Bond. It's, it's incredibly expensive. And he says, but I can get you Peter Gunn. And, and he suggested Peter Gunn and it was like Peter Gunn. I mean, I knew it. I just didn't, I didn't, I, it's you know, after, Bond. Listening, yeah, after listening to Bond, I was like, you know, John Barry, I was like, I was like, oh man, come on. And, it, but it grew on, you know, it grew on us that the, the thing that we wanted, you know, it, that we, we wanted that feeling, right? You, you have weapons, you get music, you don't have weapons, you don't get music. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the guy named, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, there's <laughs> there, a lot of, a lot of people worked on this game, but, but, but one of the things that we ran into was that theme got really repetitive if you were good. <laughs> and so, so, um, so, so Henry, Henry Mancini guy, was a Bond composer. Yeah, the sound guys decided that they were going to do a series of jazz riffs that could fit in between. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. And, and, and those those jazz riffs, they, they actually came up with this thing where um, uh, they, they, they actually TM'd it, they trademarked it. it. It was called the Artificial Artist Sound System. And the, what the Artificial Artist did is that whatever those extensions of, like it, Peter Gunn would drift out and would transition to these jazz riffs it would all work um and so um yeah i mean uh, this is this this is all like background stuff that, that nobody is crazy nobody that, cares that, about it, but i did not well no it, those jazz riffs are awesome I mean, it's funny because to me when i hear the jazz riffs in the in the game um you can tell i'm a better spy hunter player than a pinball player um they, they are like the definition of like an 8910 sound processor sound. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you get that sound and it's, and, it, and, and yeah. to me, that's such an awesome sound. Mm -hmm. It's just a very distinct and on Spy Hunter, it's so well pronounced those jazz riffs. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, uh, I mean, those guys, they, they had very little to work with, you know, um, they, they really, they, they had to do what they could with what they had. Um, and well, so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so it was definitely I, a time, but I, I, I think, you know, the, 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 getting back to, to, you know, current day, you know, James Bond pinball, we have tons of film footage from the actual games or from the actual films and, and mixed with the music. And we've, We've tried very hard to cut up the footage in such a way that it, it it's you know it seems seamless to the game. I hope you experienced some of that when you played it. Oh, it was, and and you know the like the money shots are things like, you know like you you play that entire uh, Goldfinger laser. You know he's on the laser table. Goldfinger is going to cut yep. him in half, right? And and of course, if no. you get it right, he's going to say, you know, do you expect me to talk? <laughs> No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. <laughs> it, it felt, I mean, it, it, to me, it was, you know, when you talk about, you talked about, like, the suspense and the, the fight, like, it had that feeling of, like, a Bond film. It, like, it felt like it was exciting, it was fun. I, there were things that I, it, it, it had that tension, and that was what I thought was neat about it. Um, it was a lot of fun. I'm not the best pinball player i mean i can do some stuff i'm not terrible but like i kind of started to get the hang of it um i do have one coming in two weeks i think so awesome i'll be able to get a lot more uh play time there i did have a question though about the and, and maybe there isn't one but and i'll ask about the most current so with bond is there like an idea or a concept or something you're like oh this would be awesome and you just couldn't get it to fit the theme 
you ever have that happen? Do you table it? Was there something from Bond that you were like, I'd love to do this. I can't get it to fit anywhere. So we might see it in a future machine. So, you know, with, with Bond, the biggest thing was, so I have, we have the six films that are sort of the thematically the, you know, the progression through the game. And, and so you have, uh, you know, from each film, you have key, key elements. So from every film, you have the villain. From every film, you have uh, the henchman. From every film, you have the Bond woman. And from every film, you have both the Spectre gadget and, and a Q branch gadget to, uh, you know, that. Th so, so, you know, the, um, you know, from You Only Live Twice, the Q branch gadget is a little nully. From Goldfinger, it's the DB5. Right. So it's like, you know, from Dr. No, it's the Geiger counter because they, you know, because it was sort of gadget light. You know, they were yep. just starting yep. out. They weren't figuring it out, you know. But so so you have all of these. So you have the, the key elements from each of the films. You have scenes associated with all of those, all of those, uh, the henchmen, the villains, the weapons, the gadgets. And so and, and the Bond women. So you have essentially. Uh, elements of everything and and the biggest the biggest challenge was i can't make everything as impactful as the rocket base yep. from you only live twice which occupies a large percentage of the play field i have a actual db5 which by the way uh co-licensed from aston martin and and uh uh you know we had to have aston martin's approval uh, and and it fires the ball out of the roof, you know, just like the ejector awesome. would. And and so you have elements like that. I have the dragon tank from Doctor No. I have I have Bond on a jetpack picking up the pinball with a magnet, flying around the playfield on the premiums and limited editions. It's he's not in the pro games. I have um, a little uh, diorama of the underwater Thunderball fight. Uh, underneath the play field, visible through a piece of of tinted plastic that you that we illuminate when we illuminate it, you know, when you're when when it's significant for us to illuminate it. So I have elements like that. But but like for example, from Russia with Love and Diamonds Are Forever, I while I have thematic things like, you know, you'll have a, a Batho sub fight from from Diamonds, you'll have uh, Mr. Went Mr. Kid, uh, and you have elements like that. I only have I have a Diamonds Are Forever spinner. Uh, so so how does a spinner <laughs> compare to this giant rocket base with a rocket that you hit with a ball? And it everything I have twenty and a quarter inches wide, forty five and a half inches high at the back at the back of the game. Maybe I have you know nine inches or something. And so so you you have a limit limited architecture, limited cost. I can't every every one of those gadgets can't be as complex as the ones that I have on there, a flying guy, you know, jetpack, bond on a jetpack, and 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 so I have to make trade-offs. So I really yep. wanted you asked to to get back to your question. My two favorite films, Goldfinger and and, and um, uh, Doc uh, Goldfinger and Thunderball. Uh, I'm I'm a little light on Goldfinger gadgets. I got I guess you can say I have the DB5, but I really wanted, you know, I wanted the bomb countdown. Right. I wanted I wanted to diffuse. I wanted to represent the scene where he diffuses the bomb in Fort Knox, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the, the counter is counting down. I wanted to do a scoring thing related to the counter counting down. Got to stop on 007. By the way, it really stopped on 003. But in editing, they decided that it can't stop on 003. It's got to stop on 007. So if you watch the film, <laughs> it stops on 007, but he says another three seconds <laughs> and and it would have been all over or something like that. You know, so I think that um, I wanted more. Uh, I wanted a more equal distribution of gadgets. I don't I don't have a gadget for From Russia With Love. We have the way that the shot that's assigned to From Russia With Love is a shot that uh, opens an electric gate and and creates some possibilities for combination shots, and so we you know we're gonna do you know and we 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 have scenes from that right we have uh, uh, Rosa Klebb uh, at Spectre Island and you know we have uh, we have the fight you know with 
the deadly daggers on her shoes and all that stuff. But um, I can't repre physically represent all the stuff. Yep. I have, no, and I have a prop here. Uh, and I just was curious because I went and checked because you were mentioning the James Bond, the inspiration of your James Bond stuff through your cassette tape. And I recently restored this guy. <laughs> wow. And uh, when I was playing tapes on it about a month ago, I, I picked a couple of tapes. But um, sure enough, inside there. That's it, man. Right there. That's now, it. That's now, it. This is the this is the first, the first Unbelievable. one. Unbelievable. How do you even have that? I wish I still had mine. Well, I'll send this to you. I just bought these. Oh my god. I'll send That's this to you. That's unbelievable. That's the tape. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was listening to it because it's an it's actually an interesting greatest hits compilation because if you know anything about James Bond compilations, that is the first one. Uh, this has like a bunch of music from Dr. No on it and almost all of the other greatest hits ones are just the main themes. So yeah, no, that one, one has, it, it has, uh, the Calypso tunes. Yep. Yep. So I'll send it to you. You, you can, <laughs> that's, amazing. I yeah. can't believe it. that's the tape <laughs> right here. I think, I think that's the tape. Yeah. I think that's the tape. I may be wrong, but I, that looks very much like it. That looks very much like it. James Bond greatest hits. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's great. So anyway, I had to so, I had to go grab that. <laughs> so yeah. you've got all four of the Bond variations in front of you. I know there's three, and there's one that's not announced yeah. yet. Right. And so you, so I, the one that's not announced. So I did uh, what we call the cornerstone. So I did the the pro, which is the Doctor No edition, the the premium, which is uh, you only live twice themed. And the um, the 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 limited edition is called is is Thunderball themed. When I say themed, it, I'm talking about the art on the cabinets and the back glass. The play fields are the same. Like the premium and, and limited uh, the premium and limited edition play field are identical. They have all the gadgets, all the everything. The pro, which is typically our lowest price point in commercial games, that game is intended. Uh, to go into locations, so to to create a better return on investment condition ROI for for locations, that is missing the flying jetpack guy. It's missing the underwater scene. Uh, the the sculpted guys in the underwater scene doesn't have the dragon tank physical three dimensional dragon tank, um, and it and it has a simpler. It doesn't have the ball lock around the gant the the rocket gantry for the you only have twice. It does have the rocket target. It's got the Spectre targets behind the rocket. It's got the DB5 with the ball ejecting through the roof. Uh, and it's got all the shots are the same. So, um, and that's typically how we do it. We have three different mm -hmm. price points. And with uh, the, the ultra collector version being the, the limited editions. So, and we only make a thousand of those on, on this game. So there's a fourth game, which is what we call the 60th anniversary edition. And it's a very interesting game. It's a game that the licensor requested. They, when we started talking about pinball machines to them, they had a nostalgic feel for the notion of um, an old type, old style pinball machine. So the 60th anniversary game, which is done by one of the one of the most talented designers in my studio, a guy named Keith Elwin, who just did the Godzilla product, um, has had a string of hits with you know. Avengers and Jurassic Park and 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 Iron Maiden and and then most recently Godzilla, uh, and he's happens to be one of the one of the best pinball players in the world. Um, uh, him and a guy named Mark Panaccio, one of the software engineers in my studio, also very talented. They uh, raised their hands to work on the 60th anniversary product, and they, and the 60th anniversary product is a lot different than. The stuff that I've done. It's a mm -hmm. single level play field, like old school 80s sort of game, 80s and before. So it doesn't have any ramps. It's all pinball gadgets, lots of drop targets, spinners, pop bumpers. They do have a really cool uh, odd job themed spinner in the oh, center cool. of the game. It's and, a hat. Uh, yeah. Most, and it, one of the coolest things is they have, they actually have reels, score reels. Oh, in the back cool. box 
Um, and then they do have a display. They have the small display from our home editions uh, flush on a play field. But that covers the six bonds. Wow. So they actually have audio of each. They have audio of uh, uh, Sean Connery, uh, Roger Moore, uh, Ro- uh, George Lazenby, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan, and Daniel Craig saying Bond, James Bond. So at the appropriate times, as you work your way through the bonds, and of course they've got all the all the they've got an appropriate villain for each of the bonds. So you know I think Jaws is the is the Roger Moore villain. Sure. They have um, uh, they have gadgets. You know they have the underwater Lotus. They have the DB5. They have different different gadgets for each bond. So it's a very cool and very different game. It's going to be made in a very limited quantity, 500 games. Wow. Um, it's very special. It has the cabinet sides have uh, film posters from all 25 films. So one side has 12 posters, the other side is 13 posters, and then the back glass has an iconic illustration from movie posters from each Bond, all compiled together. Um, it's very cool. It's a very different uh, Bond experience. A lot of I, I uh, surprisingly, I've had. A lot of people reached out to me and said, I have to own both. I have to own your limited edition and Elwin's limited edition. Um, and so we haven't announced it yet. We'll, you'll see it hopefully mid, mid-December. You'll see it. And, um, wow. and with all the, and, and so, but I've been, you know, I think I'm very excited about the game because I think it's a very different take on uh, not only modern pinball, but also, uh, uh, the, the you know it, it it fills out Bond right so mine is very focused on the six Connery films. Uh, his has the universe of Bond and uh, and so it's uh, it's very very different. Ellen, I mean, uh, I, we just picked up a Godzilla a month ago, and that is an amazing yeah. game. I mean, just uh, I, I, the first time the ball came around the loop and then caught that magnetic post and swung back up, I it like I just never seen that, and it was yeah, just one a, of those a, like, oh, this is amazing. Yeah, the, it, it you know, me. it's a it's a very it's it's a very inspired team. Um, I'm very proud of those guys. Uh, they 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 are a great fit together, um, and they and they've done some amazing stuff. Uh, Rick Nagel, his his uh, his uh, lead developer, Harrison Drake, his project engineer. Um, they've had some great art, you know, art uh, from from uh, our friend Jeremy Packer, Zombie Yeti, on um, on most of their games. Uh, they, uh, you know, very inspired team, and they've done they've done some amazing stuff. So I've heard I've heard a few different interviews where you talk about um, the machine you're playing, and it seems like that changes over time. Is there, what's the machine you're playing right now? And is it Bond? Is it well, something else? Yeah, it's what Bond you... right now. It's very much Bond. I mean, I have, look, every day, I play Bond every day, and I, I, I talk to the team about what I think, what I feel, what, what's right, what's wrong, and, and, and it's going to be like this for a long time, you know, because I think that it's the nature of developing the game. We still, we, uh, I think the code is at like dot seven or something. So we, we're far from done. We, a uh, part of this is not, it's not us. It's the fact that, that uh, the complexity of integrating the film clips, and we have so many of them. We have, you know, when we started out, uh, the, the deal we made on the, fi- on the film clips gave us access to a lot of stuff. And so we're trying very hard to show it off, to make it right, and and to, and to create uh, a, a that you mentioned, you know, you said I'm not a very good pinball player, or I'm not that that I'm not that good, whatever. The the fact that you had fun with the game um, makes me feel great because it's not just about uh, Keith Owen. It's not just about yeah. expert players. Everybody has to have a good time, and so it's kind of like somebody has to. If 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 everybody doesn't have a good time, then I I haven't done my job right. I haven't you know. So so the rocket base, you know, take down the three drop targets, and then make that one shot and 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 lock three balls and start a multi ball. Even if you don't get that far and you don't start the multi ball, it's just fun to bash the rocket. Yeah, it is. So you know, right? And so it's kind of like. 
that that particular target is not difficult, and yet it's a big target with big effect and a lot of feedback. And and that the intention of that target was to make anybody have fun. And and so you know, do I have things for Elwin? Yes, I do. If you you know that upper flipper, those upper flipper shots are very I difficult. Hate upper flipper shots. <laughs> very difficult. I, I so, have a my one of my favorite games is Whirlwind, and I've owned it for. 15 years and i still can't hit the damn upper like i, yeah, I, mean, I just cannot look, get it. It, it it's it's there it requires a tremendous amount of uh hand eye coordination it the a pinball you know if you think about pinball pinball is a ball and bat game yep just like playing tennis just like playing baseball the the you know timing and and understanding the velocity of the ball the first time, if you ever stepped on a tennis court, first time you stepped on a tennis court, man, that ball seemed like it was going 1,000 miles an hour. Yep. Now, the more you stepped on a tennis court, the more you played, the, the more your, man, your mind's eye came to grips with the frame of reference of the ball moving through space towards you, whatever it is, and what you had to do to respond to that. Pinball's the same way. The more you play the more your mind's eye will actually slow the world down under that glass and, and give you an opportunity and, and, and give you understanding about where the ball is going, what it's going to do, and all that kind of stuff. So those upper flipper shots are all about those ace players, right? Those guys, and if they get it right, it's going to feel incredible, it's it is it easy to do no it's not and, so just, and, and even the outside shots the outside the ramp shot and the orbit shot off the tip of the flipper tough yep. shots so you just hit exactly why i'm terrible at pinball and tennis because in tennis I, it's the same thing i get out there i can hit the first shot somebody hits me a shot doesn't matter how hard it is where it is I can return it, and then I end up watching it going, that was a good shot. Same thing in pinball. Bam. That's a good shot. Oh, wait. I got to do something again. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know what? The, look at – imagine imagine standing in a batter's box in the in the major leagues. Yep. And, and you, you have a 95-mile-an-hour fastball coming your right. way. Who, who can hit that? Well, a guy that's oh. been – a guy that's been standing in batter boxes since he was seven. That's who can hit that. So, so one right? of the... Who actually, it's not just standing in the batter's boxes. It's making your way through, you know, Little League and Pony League and, and you know, and, and college ball. And, and, and you know, I, I mean, all the way up. And, yeah, you're in the show now. You're in the big leagues. And you can do that because you've spent that much time. You've put that much effort into the skill of managing that situation. And a pinball machine, honestly, is not any different. You, yep. the more you play, the better you will get. And the inv- and you know, it just the 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 million dollar question. If it's compelling enough to you, you will make that investment. If it's not, you you know, if it, you, it's perfectly fine to be casual and be entertained by this thing, or to appreciate it for 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 you know its amazingness. Without being the best player, I'm not uh, an ace player by any stretch. I would never, you know, I'd, I'd be, I'd probably be a C grade player if I ever earned, entered a tournament. Um, I have, I have moments of brilliance, right? I have like, like I'll have, my, I, my history of pinball is, I'll play my, I love my Deadpool game. I'll play my Deadpool game, and every, every, you know, eight games, I have an, what, what I consider an amazing game. And, 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 uh, you know, and, and the other seven were just, eh, you know, like, I don't want anyone to see that score. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There, so getting there... back to Brian's original question, I think <clears throat> what I'd like to know is, okay, you like Deadpool. That's cool. Right. Yeah. Uh, what of the original nineties uh, games if in your collection, which of those is your favorite? Then let's move to the 2000s and then pick one yeah. from today. Right. So um, when I first started, you got to remember, you know, I, I, so I designed the, the um, you know, 
late seventies, early eighties video games. My first seven years out of school were at Midway Games. Uh, after Midway Games, I was a toy inventor at a consulting firm, Marvin Glass and Associates. I invented toys, who so licensed all the big toy companies for about five years. I then I, I then uh, went through a, a stint of time where I did novelty games, uh, you know, ticket spitters, a variety of different things. I did a a lot of localization game uh, work for Japanese video game companies. I did a variety of different things. So um, in in Early in the early uh, in the you know, early nineties, I discovered pinball from the standpoint of wouldn't it be fun to design these things? And I I managed to get a job at Williams Electronics, um, you know, designing Williams and Bally pinballs. First game I made was was Corvette. Second game was Johnny Mnemonic. Third game was NBA Fast Break. Fourth game was Monster Bash. I think that the you know the fifth game was uh, Pinball 2000: uh, Revenge for Mars. I think that games. Everybody asks me this question all the time. What's your favorite? I, I have to tell you that it's kind of like somebody saying to you, "What's your favorite piece of music?" Okay. You know, yeah, fair they're, enough. They're, they're, you know, it's contextual, right? It's yep. it's it's contextual. Now I'll tell you this about my games. I I can walk up to an old game, a Johnny Mnemonic or whatever. And I play I, I play that game for a few minutes and it I can flash back. It's like a trance. It's like stepping into a time machine. I know everything that was going on in my life at the time. I know, you know, who my girlfriend was, what what you know, what was going on, what car I was driving, what er, everything that was happening. I also remember fondly, even though they were painful at the time, the drama of 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 actually working and doing, uh, making the game, sure. right? Because games are a fight and you got to love the fight. And so it's kind of like, you know, the, the, you know, you, in some cases, you know, you have, you have licensing challenges, you have company challenges, production challenges, you have like, uh, a, a lot of technology challenges, right? So you got, you have a piece of technology that you've invented and every day for months, this team of people, your software engineer, yourself, your mechanical engineer, your electrical engineer are fighting to get this thing to actually work the way you want it to work. And 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 those those are challenges that are different than let's make this thing fun. Right. Right? Let's make this thing fun and it's a challenge in and of itself. That's let's make this thing fun is a lot about iteration. It's the ability to to you know, try this, try that. You know, okay, that was that was cool. Let's tr okay. What? How do we make it cooler? What? How do we? What do we? Add, what do we do to add to it? But uh, okay. So, getting back to your question, some of my favorites. Um, love the way Johnny Mnemonic shoots. I I think it's one of my best shooting playfields. Um, I love Monster Bash. Monster Bash is a favorite. Uh, people come over to my house. It doesn't matter what age they are. It doesn't matter what, you know, male, female. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, people gravitate to that game. Yep. Uh, little kids love Revenge from Mars. The notion of a pinball machine married to a video game is like, they don't even question it. To them, it's like the most natural thing in the world. <laughs> so, so literally, if you are under 12 and you come to my house, <laughs> I guarantee you that without me saying a word, they're going to be parked in front of the Revenge from Mars. And, 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 uh, and so um, women, this is just an observation, love the Monster Bash. The women love that game. The, the, you know, it's funny. It's quirky. It's, it's lighthearted. It doesn't, you know, everybody feels good coming off of it. It doesn't require a tremendous amount of skill to make something fun happen. Um, so I, I love my Monster Bash. I love the way my Lord of the Rings shoots. I think the rule set is like a thing that is, you know, challenges me. I think that uh, that it's very difficult to progress through that game. Um, and, and yet I enjoy shooting it. I enjoy like the kinetics of it. Um, uh, I love Deadpool, absolutely love Deadpool. And I am doing everything in my power right now to, uh, you know, to, to, to make, you know, to come off a bond with, 
with the same feelings that I have when I come off a of Deadpool, different games, different stuff, but I want to be compelled to come back to it. So, so you asked me, what am I playing today? I'm playing James Bond every day, trying to make it better, mm -hmm. working with the team mm -hmm. to get, um, to get it to feel right, to get it, you know, to get the bond experience across. Um, uh, I've done two Batmans. I did the dark Knight, um, the, you know, the Christian Bale, uh, era Batman, and I did uh, the Bruce Wayne era Batman uh, much later uh, with Mr. Wayne's cooperation and my good friend Lyman Sheets at the at the helm on the rules and um, and the software. And and honestly, that game is amazing in that it takes me back to when I was, you know, nine years old watching Batman on TV. We had all the film clips. Uh, Lyman uh, did a masterful job of choreographing that stuff so it feels so natural to the game so i mean those are my favorites and i can't tell you that you know uh, i mean i so in a podcast a couple weeks ago somebody said you know what do you, you know what am i taking to a desert island well today and only right. today because bond's not finished and and a month from now or two months from now when bond is polished the the the, the answer may be bond but Today, the answer is probably Deadpool or Monster Bash, you know, games that I could just walk up to and have a good time. They make me smile. Uh, they crack me up. And uh, and I'm trying, I, you know, I'm, my goal is that, uh, you know, Bond is going to be just as fun. And, it, and it's going to be that Bond experience that I had as a kid where I was amazed. Um, that Christmas of 1965, I asked for the attache case and I got it. <laughs> you know the, the james bond attached case with all the stuff yeah um Maybe. did it come with a piece of hair <laughs> <laughs> that's great i remember that hair trick all the time I, me too i was telling you know i was trying to explain it to my girlfriend she just, just didn't get it she was like um, what <laughs> like, the first yeah, the first you... time i saw that in the film i was like what that is the most <laughs> brilliant thing ever puts a piece Why of hair you... across the I'm door a kid. i'm a kid i'm like you know i'm telling my sister if you go in my room, I'm going to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I licked a piece of hair and I stuck it on there. <laughs> He's like, you went in my room. She goes, I didn't go in your room. I said, yeah, the, 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 the hair just, it must have just dried up and fallen off. <laughs> you know, is, I, I get asked your... a lot of the time, too, uh, you know, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite? You mentioned music, too. Like, what's your favorite record? I was in the record store the other day, and I... I I'm there quite often, and um, they're like, so, um, you know, what's your top three records? I'm like, that, that's not even possible. It's not. So I can I can relate. Yeah, it's, it, the games are the same way. Yeah. I I play all kinds of games, you know, and I and I don't. Um, it's really hard. I mean, there are games that I'm like, uh, and you know, you're into it. At that particular moment in time, you remember it fondly, and the, the best ones are the ones yeah. that stand the test of time, right? A Monster Bash stands the test of time. Sure. I guarantee you. I walk up to a Monster Bash. Uh, when I get home tonight, if I walked up to that game, fired it up, played it, I guarantee I'd have a good time. Um, love it. And and so it's, it doesn't matter when I walk up to it. And my Deadpool's that same way. You know, Deadpool's making fun of me. I'm laughing at him making fun of me. And, and it's just... just it's just a good time. Does Stern well, have the? Is Stern able to rerun games like after you've? Is your license for a certain amount of time? Yeah, the license for a certain amount of time. We extend licenses from time to time if there's demand for the product. We'll extend the license. Sure. Um, a lot of so a lot of the audience is really confused about licensing. They don't really understand how it works or. Yeah. Or what? What is it? You know, why can't they just do this kind of thing? Yeah. Um, so you guys know this licensing is very complex. Yep. And and there's a lot of moving parts. And so just because I have a, a James Bond license doesn't necessarily mean that I have the right to do whatever I want or in or have any music I want or any. I can't, you know, I have restrictions even on how I can execute on the things I've actually paid for. So yeah. I have, um, you know, I had somebody call me out because the logo, 
the 007 logo that's on the games is not the 007 logo from the era from that era of films. Sure. And I and and I said I said I know it's it's not, but this is the 007 logo <laughs> that the licensor stipulated that I use. Yeah. So yeah. I understand that this is not the logo from that time, <laughs> but so, so I mean these restrictions. It, it, you know, it could be an actor that doesn't want to participate in the licensing process with the particular, you know, owner or brand, uh, owner of the brand, or it, it could be an actor that requires specific likeness approvals. Um, it could be something, look, uh, Aston Martin had to approve the molded Aston Martin that we made for the for the game. You could just that's not an Aston it. Martin off the shelf. That's a, oh, that was... we modeled that, we created it. And it had to go, it had to pass muster, everything, yeah. the color, the finish, the, you know, what are you going to, you know, how much chrome do you have? And, and, and what do the license plates say? And uh, the whole thing. So I think, I think that, uh, it's, it's people the don't DB5, understand that right? stuff. It's the DB5. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because we just went through this. We licensed a bunch of Atari stuff and the swooshes that are on Atari have changed over time. And we're told very specifically which ones we needed to use. And then the word, I mean, it's like every little detail. And it's funny because just over like literally two lines on a PCB, we've gone back and forth six times, making sure that it like has all the little, it does the, you know, Atari incorporated have a period after not a period. I mean, like stuff like that, that you're just like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. And That's it's, right. um, it's a, it's, it's amazing. So when you say like people don't understand and, and every company is different. When we work with Taito, it's a completely different set of rules than we work with Atari and like the exactly. expectations are different. And so, you know, it, it's, it's really, it's fun. And it's, it's definitely, to me, it's been a fun process to learn and do that and work with the people. But it also is like pulling your hair out sometimes because you're like, what does this matter? <laughs> yeah. No, you know, what, what most of, most of the, so, so here's an interesting one. A lot of our uh, easier license, you know, licensors have been the rock bands. Oh, they just huh. want you. They just want you to do something cool. And and you know, you know, you know, they're going to have something to say about how you use their logo or where, when, you know, what music you get, stuff like that. But they've really been great. Um, uh, and and then you know, licensing. Look, these are business relationships like we talked about. Right. And and what does that mean? It means that the you know, the fourth product you do with Lucasfilm is going to be way easier than the first one you did. And the 10th product that you do with Marvel is going to be way easier than the first one you did. And so you say by the time that I got around to doing Deadpool, um, we had done a lot of Marvel product and our friend over there knows how to keep us on the straight and narrow in terms of what we can and can't do. Um, you know, a um, guy named Jesse Falcon who works with us and, and, you know, Jesse basically says, do, you know, stay here, stay in this, you know, this is what I, where I want you guys. And, <clears throat> and that, that's hugely helpful. And, and it may be that, I mean, they have something to say about what, send me a list of the villains you want to use. Okay. Here's the, here's my list. Okay, you can get you get this one, this one, this one, this one. You don't get that one. You don't, you know, and absolutely you don't get that one. And and then okay, what about eras, costumes? Uh, you know, I I want you know look look I you know, Deadpool is going to time travel. I want him to you know I want him to interact with the, the T Rex and a, uh, you know I mean and Megalodon and and all this stuff. And it was like yeah okay that's cool. <laughs> so it's like. <laughs> But, but then you'll you know he'll he'll also tell me, dude, are you what are you guys doing with this Wolverine costume? <laughs> like, like, he says, you guys are like in a different era. Are you are you inventing your own costumes now? That's what he says to me. So I was like, no 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 no. What what costume do you want? What is it? Tell me what costume. I I got you. You know. That's awesome. Yeah. It was we did um so I, we remade ice cold beer. Yeah, I love it. I love right it. Now. One of and my I, favorite, one of my favorite games of all time. I mean, I think that thing is so much fun in bars. Um, yep. You know, I was telling Adam that they've got one over at um, they they they've got one over at uh, um, 
Logan Arcade here in the city and uh, mess around with that all the time. Well, we'll have a bunch of these running, hopefully down the production line in the next four weeks. You got about 500 for the first run. Fantastic. Which is a, a big deal for us. But it's funny because like you talk about licensing, we're sitting there with the Taito executives saying, hey, you know, it'd be really cool. Let's do a Space Invaders one. Yeah. And the executive's like, oh, hmm. No. <laughs> that might be tough with legal. I mean, that's a good idea. But and I'm, I'm like, you guys are, this is your company. You should be able to say <laughs> yeah. yes. And they're like, yeah. no. <laughs> and then. Yeah, no, like, you know, licensing is. So the other thing that your audience may or may not know is that licensing within a brand is incredibly compartmentalized. So, you know, there are things that like, for example, if you, you know, if you're in toys and games, um, as long as you don't do this, you won't have to get permission from from interactive products across the hall. Right. You know, but it is. But it's kind of like if you cross this line, you know, so it's like well, you, if you cross this line. I got to go talk to the guy across the hall. So uh, I think that, you know, that's that that's a challenge right and if you look if you're a company that like you take a logo and you put it on a on a t-shirt or you you know on a coffee mug or something what do you think happens when i show up with a pinball machine yeah it's like look i have an i have i have i have <laughs> electromechanical things that transform on the play field they represent they're going to be molded to look like icons from your brand I've got, I've got, there are game rules, uh, a yep. pinball game. Anyone can do anything at any time. So I can't, yep. you know, when I first started working with, we, we, we did the Star Wars product, the guys at, at Lucasfilm said, well, you, you know, you can't do this before you do that. That's in, that's out of the sequence of the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pinball machine, man. I mean, yeah. it's like, you know, <laughs> over there. And we'll just, you got to we'll show the guy this, this part of the play field <laughs> off. <laughs> you got to show him the Death Star. I was like, I can't, I can't control what he's going to do when he's going to do it. Now, uh, you know, a few months later, they understood. Oh, I got it. Yeah, it's cool. So, so, but, but that, that kind of, uh, those kinds of things are incredibly, uh, in, you know, they are the work of, of implementing a brand um, on, in a particular medium, right? Your ice cold beer, a media, you know, a uh, pinball machine, a, a video game, um, it's, it's an art medium. And, and it's an art medium no different than oil painting and watercolor or, or creating a piece of music. It's an art medium. And the implementing these concepts applying these brands within your medium is the challenge that yep. we as designers face right when that was and the funny thing for me was so we're, we're sitting there and we have a license to put whatever so we can put whatever branding we can actually scrap it we have a right to do the machine with whatever artwork we want and so i'm sitting there the Taito guys leave and frank castellano's there and i said frank you know we should do a pac-man one that'd be hilarious and he looks at me he's like better reaction than the Taito guys like you know you should sketch something up or mock it up we'd love to see that <laughs> like so the guys who actually own the rights licensed us are going like ah maybe not t space invaders and namco's going i'd like to see that <laughs> yeah. and so it's just the the funny thing and i and i and i think the majority of the world doesn't understand like you're getting to is this complexity of licensing and how the brands view themselves and also view where they where they see their advantages and want their image to appear, you know, and yeah, why? Yeah, and, and it so so it's not only the you know, and and it's not only that. Sometimes they don't understand the yep. genre of thing that you're trying to bring them, right? When when I always say when we do it right, it looks like they made it. Yeah. Right. When you know, it's like we did uh, we did we did a Ford Mustang product back in 2014 for the you know 50th anniversary of the Mustang and. And and the Ford guy, the best compliment that they could pay us was, you know, I was at a, an auto show with the Ford guy and the guy said to me, he goes, damn, that thing looks like we made it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was like, yeah, that's like that means we got it right. <laughs>
Well, I'll, I'll tell you, after doing this, I mean, this is like riding a tricycle compared to like designing a motorcycle that you guys do. I, I, my, I, my respect for the amount of effort, design, and coordination that goes into the machines you guys do, and then the production, going from prototype to production stage, um, it's astounding. I mean, I, I've done medical products in the past. I've done a whole number of things. And the electromechanical aspect of things, and this is simple. I mean, we've got two motors, a screwdrive, and a bar, right? I mean, it's not a, a couple, you know, and a bunch of optical sensors. But compared to a pinball machine, I mean, this this is like maybe the bottom right, you know, six by six corner of your play field for technology. And to see you guys pull off the machines coming off the end of the line with everything working and everything functioning and working together. You know, it, it is an amazing thing. And I think people that have one or two things go wrong over time don't understand how many times you're doing that thousands of times. Yeah, we, we get it, it every time. We get it right a lot more than we get it wrong. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the world we live in makes the one, you know, everyone's got a voice. Yep. And the loudest voices are sometimes not necessarily representative of the true audience. Right. So and we don't, by the way, I don't mean that as any excuse that we should get uh, that we should be allowed to get no. something wrong. We, we we make mistakes just like everybody else. And and we haven't um, you know, we're not perfect by any stretch. Uh, but it's just... and I, I'll tell you that we work really hard to get better every day. I'll tell you that. Um, and and I um, and I, I you know, I'm never we are never happy with how good we are. We are always thinking, man, it, you know, I, I mean, I'm I I'm a broken record about the what we have to do to, uh, you know, make our quality better. I'm a customer. Right. Yep. So it's kind of like I I I buy our own games. I I own, our, you know, the games we make and and I'm a customer. I want that thing to come out of the box and be perfect. The, the, one of the challenges we face is and no one thinks about this. So. So our current audience, some large percent of our, of our of our current audience is consumers, not commercial. Yep. In, in the commercial environment, we we our product originated in uh, as a commercial product. The the expectations in terms of fit and finish <laughs> uh, and durability uh, uh, are. I mean, it's like from the standpoint of the commercial world, that sucker's got to work. Because yep. it, it's all about earning money, um, and and they understand that it's like the brakes on your car; it's going to wear out the yep. more you use it. And from their perspective, um, in some ways, if if it it just needs to be up and running every day and working, and and earning money, and and they're less concerned that it's got a little flake of of. of of, uh, you know, hard code here, or it's got this, you know, it's got a scratch here, or it's got this. But that said, the new audience is expecting <laughs> those materials, those processes to be substantially more sophisticated and substantially higher grade finishes. Yep. Because everything else that they come in contact with is. So, yep. you know, when they buy a Honda, or they take an iPhone out of the box, or they buy an i, you know, a Lenovo computer, or whatever it is, or a Sony TV, or a Samsung TV, or anything like that. They expect those levels of quality, and and so, not that not that we shouldn't aspire to that, but those playing fields aren't necessarily e even. Yep. Right. So you I don't, you know. We don't manufacture in the volumes that would allow us to make the tooling expenditures and the, and the material finish expenditures that those brands can make, yeah. right? So, and this is something no one, you know, no one ever puts this piece of the puzzle together, right? Because they, it's not in the kind of, you know, in, 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 the, in, in the world they're used to. So they just want... They just want similar quality, uh, similar fit and finish expectations. I can tell you that today that uh, in spite of whatever quality issues we have, 
Sturm pinball machines are the most reliable pinball machines on the planet. Mm -hmm. We, uh, and, and they are, and, and, and the proof in that pudding is that they are the most operated, that they are the most professionally operated machines in the world, bar none yep. uh, today. And so, so I think that, you know, that's real. That's not, you know, that's not bullshit. You know, it's like an operator is going to buy the Sturm pinball. They're not going to risk some of this other stuff. I mean, some do, um, and they do, and they, they they do it with the notion that if this thing doesn't work out, I'm I'm flipping it, and and somebody will pick it up. But um, but any hardcore real you know real operator that's earning money with the machines and earning a living with the machines is they're buying a stern pinball. That that it's that simple. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they're here and you know in the UK or in Holland or Italy or wherever it is. That's that's the bottom line. So now. Could, can can we be better? Yeah, I want to get I want to get all these fit and finish things to the point where nobody has an issue comparing me with a brand that makes um, you know a uh, hundred times more products and therefore can afford uh, you know uh, more sophisticated materials, processes, and 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 tooling, right? It is, it is always a challenge, and I think that's one of the things that it's, it's interesting because there are certain levels that when you get to, I don't, people don't realize how much easier it is to do it for that price. And that, I mean, the price is the other driving factor. Nobody wants, you know, yeah, sure, we can make this whatever you want. You just have to pay an extra $1,000. I don't want to pay an extra $1,000. Well, then this is what you get. Like there's a certain exchange back and forth. Absolutely. And I think it's it's interesting to see that play out. And a lot of people kind of look at it and go, and what we've gotten on this one is, well, I could build that myself. Go do it. Yeah. And then yeah. it's like, then, you know, a couple months oh, yeah. later, when is it going to be ready? <laughs> no, 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 that's right. No, it's right. It, it's, I think you have to, um, yeah, look, you know, it's, it's, it's the old story, you know, like you got to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes and then before you really understand it. Right. And then you're well, not gonna until you do. And after doing this, I don't want to walk a mile in your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to enjoy your games. I'll buy them and I'll have yeah. fun with them. And I'll let you have those shoes. We're 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 you know we I'm I'm blessed, right? The studio here, the the guys I have here, um, they are the best in the world at doing this. And so, and even being the best in the world, we still have challenges. We still have problems. We still yep. screw things up. Um, but we have um, the, you know, the 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 amount of tribal knowledge um, is unsurpassed. And, and you guys, the, have, um, if you run into those you know, problems, you have the talent to fix it. I'm and sorry. I said, if you run into those kinds of problems, you have the talent to fix it. Yeah, so. I mean, I have. I mean, eventually, we, you know, we we always get out of whatever jams we get into. Sure. You know, you know, it's funny because in, uh, in my main job, uh, as a surgeon, I, I tell patients, you never want to go to the surgeons that say they have no complications because they're either hiding them or they're lying. And so it doesn't matter how good you are. Things are not always going to go right. And you want to go to the guys that are honest about it. And when it goes wrong, they take care of it. And that's it. You know, and that's what you're saying. It's like, you're being very honest, very honest that we have some challenges. We're dealing with them and we're striving for perfection. And that, mm -hmm. that to me is an honest, earnest business that like, that you can trust because any business that gets up and says, Oh, we don't have any, we've never had a failure of a device. They're, they're just full of it. Or they're ignoring the, they're ignoring the, the feedback. And if you ignore the feedback, you're never going to get better. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you have to be, look, I, I, you have to be honest about what what you do, and you got to come yep. and face yourself every day. So, um, yeah, I don't. I'll tell you what i I don't um, I don't know how you do that job, right? I was like, I have all kinds of <laughs> I have all kinds of shoulder issues. I was I was telling Adams, uh, I was telling Adam earlier that um, yeah, you know, I have like chronic rotator problems and all kinds of things like that, you know, and. I'm a, like my my orthopedics guy is on speed dial. You know? <laughs> I'm if if you if you look up and see me, it's a bad day because I'm the trauma guy. I put the people back together that really get messed up. But it's you know it's funny because for me, um, it's just a it's a it's a very 
uh, zen place for me. I just I love being in the operating room. There's no place better. I mean, it's almost like I'd rather be in the operating room than almost anywhere else. And so for some reason, it's just what I love to do. And I'm lucky enough. I, like you said, you're blessed. I, I'm blessed that what I love doing, people are willing to pay me for and I'm good at. And so it's just like I got ridiculously blessed to have that. So, but that being said, you know, I, I really do. So I wish you would have been, I, I would, you, you know, um, I think it was on, you know, uh, in September, I went sailing with a buddy of mine. I, um, I was, we we're getting the sailboat back on the dock and I, I jumped off the boat and, uh, slipped, fell backwards and dislocated my right shoulder. My left shoulder dislocates on a regular basis, you know? And, um, so, you know, I can usually get the left one in by myself. Uh, and I, ha I have made, I have to, ha I have had to make three, um, you know, over the course of the, the, I don't know, since 2014, when I first dislocated it, I have had to have like three trips to the ER to get it back yep. in. But the, on the right one who had never come out until this, uh, last September and, um, and I, I go to the ER, I couldn't get it back in myself. And, um, I go to the ER and first the resident tries, <laughs> then, the, then the attending tries. Oh. And then the next conversation they're having with me is, we're going to have to put you out. <laughs> and out, you know, out comes the morphine and the ketamine. <laughs> like six hours later, I'm walking home, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I was like, I wish you would have been there. <laughs> you're, like a, you're, you're like a... A GI Joe doll, just you know, pull the oh, arms yeah. off and so, put them back on. So I'll tell you, it's kind of funny when I show up at the ER to do reductions. They'll call me in, and the patient says to me, "It's the one time I I, I put a little bit of a cocky face on when I'm doing what I do." And I, the patient <laughs> says, "Why are you going to do this? Because the other guys tried and they failed." And I just look at them and I say, "They don't call me in to fail." And. <laughs> I have done probably about three or 400 reductions in the last, you know, six years. And I've missed two of them. Wow. And, and I say it every time. And those two, they look at me and they go, really? They don't call you in to fail, huh? <laughs> so I'll tell you, I, you know, you know what I want from you? Give me some advice on like what, what technique, and you don't have to do this now. You, I want you to think about this yeah. and send me an email. Yeah, of course. I'm by myself. What technique should I try? Actually, I can tell you the easy one. It's lie on a table, put a weight in your arm. Okay. Like hang, hang the arm off. And if you can hold as much as you can hold in your arm, face down on a table and let the shoulder I've right seen here it. Yeah, I've seen hang it. off. Yeah. Yeah. That'll do it. You just got to okay. lie there long enough. To, the, the trick is fatiguing the muscles. Sometimes okay. it takes 15, 20 minutes. Okay. And when they fatigue, you'll feel it start to shift and it'll pop in. Okay. That sounds That's horrible. <laughs> Thank you. Also, this uh, entire this entire podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for hijacking really this podcast. Well, you know, my yeah. my guy tells me he goes, just call me. Like, no, I don't want to call you. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I don't want to call you. You don't understand. I always felt the like, true <laughs> stars at Atari was engineering. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, all right. Well, now Brian, I I'm gonna hold you to it next time that right. sucker comes out. You let me know. You you let me know. Okay. <laughs> you can hold me accountable for that one. That's funny. <laughs> That's great. That's fantastic. I've seen. You know, I have gone online and researched it, yep. right? Because I, you know, I'm concerned. I, like, hey, I'm, I'm by myself. It could happen anytime. I fall over, or whatever. I slip. I, you know, yep. reach for something, <laughs> and uh, and so I've thought like. How do I do this by myself? I mean, most of the time, when I get it back in on the one on the, the the it's the left one that very easily comes out because it's come out too many times. <laughs> um, it I don't think it's completely out. I think it's like partially out. Yep. And so, uh, like a twerking movement or something, I can get it back in. At our ages, but, we should never twerk. <laughs> <laughs> I was on an airplane. I was in. And I reached up to close the overhead and it dislocated yep. it. Yeah. And it was on it was on the ground about to take off. Now I'm standing there thinking, Am I getting off this airplane? Am I stopping this show? What am I doing? And I and I went I went like this and I got I managed to get it back in. And I was like, 
unbelievable. <laughs> the left side, if it's that loose, you'll be easier. And yeah. what they do in the movies where they bang it on a wall, that's just BS. I mean, that just doesn't work. You know, right. you see so, those guys in the movies that – I tried it that, and it doesn't work. <laughs> not at all. Well, th- thanks for ru- ruining the every thing lethal was, weapon movie. It gave me movie. horrible black and blues. <laughs> so I have, these, I have these big hands, and it's oh, funny because patients are like, are you a surgeon with those hands? You should be like a lumberjack. But one of the things I have done and ones that we had a hard time with was I've grabbed the shoulder on the back and used my finger to push it in when when they're out. And it leaves it leaves a pretty good bruise. <laughs> it's not so, you know, it's, it's usually light. it's 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 in front, right? It's like yeah. right here. Yep. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, you know, it, uh, yeah, it's not pretty. It's not a pretty sight, Adam. <laughs> like, no. Brian's seen a lot of these, but yep. and I, I've seen mine, and it's like you know, I'm like, I am deformed. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, I've got right left way. shoulder problems right now, but I'm not bringing oh. them up. Yeah, right. we'll just well, wait. Wait until they're so bad I can't lift my microphone. So. George, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you being on the show, yeah. and um, and Likewise. really, all you guys, uh, all you've done over the years. You made my favorite game, Spy Hunters. By far, I, I love that game. Um, and many of the other iconic machines. And, and just that you've continued doing this, teaching other people, working with these teams, and building up really kind of the next generation of pinball designers um, and the games they're bringing forth. I, I can't really thank you enough because all of us, this is, you know, when, it's what we love doing in our spare time. We, we collect them. We look forward to them when the new Stern title launches, everybody wants to see it. And I really appreciate that you, you bring that to us. So thank you. Yes. Well, well, thanks a lot, guys. I mean, uh, you know, I always enjoy talking to you guys. It, it's been a while since we last talked. Yeah. Um, Adam, all you got to do is just, just give me more, give me as much notice as you can give me. Sure. My schedule is really crazy. We can do this whenever you guys want. I think that, um, you know, it's 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 fun to talk about the stuff. I I'm totally, um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm um, I'm I'm really happy that you guys uh, have the appreciation for the work that you do, and um, you know, it's 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 just fun. It's just a lot of fun to talk. So about about the stuff. Well, one um, one of the things that we hope we do right is <clears throat> we do a little bit of digging to find out what you've been talking about lately and we try not to be repetitive. So I hope it was interesting for you as, as well. Um, yeah, it was, no, I, I I loved it. It It's a pretty easy going chat with you guys. And, um, and uh, you know, Brian, I can't believe you dug out to Gerald Ford. (laughs) I mean, I had no idea where, where, where did that go? (laughs) He called me, he called me earlier tonight and said, I want to open with, I'm like, this is a good idea. But yeah, I mean that was brilliant. To to yeah, so uh, you know what? Uh, stick with us while we do our quick outro here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we'll uh, we'll give you a proper send off. Uh, awesome. And I guess uh, that means I've got to go hit the right. You button. hit the button. So uh, thanks for listening in. Uh, this has been the Double R's. That's Arcade Radio. Check out our website. That's Arcade Radio. That's R C A D E R A D I O dot com for all of our social media and swag links. Or you can call and leave us a message like Mr. Bob Zarzadek at 612 548 Game. That's 4263. Are you enjoying the show? Pick up some Arcade Radio swag over at uh, Arcade Radio Creator Spring dot com or consider supporting our Patreon campaign over at patreon.com slash arcade radio. There's multiple tiers starting at just $3 a month. Any bit helps with the show. You do not have to hit Adam's OnlyFans to do that. <laughs> All right. So subscribe to our <laughs> Twitch channel. That's the one you're listening to right now. Um, or follow us. And then uh, you can click that little notification thingy dingy so you know when we're on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and if you like what you're hearing, consider a five-star review at Anchor, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume our podcast. All right. Well, that's going to be it for tonight's show from Arcade Radio. We hope to see you in the chat on our next episode. <laughs>